The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Good morning. Ms Hogan Doran, I'll be ready to proceed. Yes, Chair. Hmm. Commissioners, this morning you will hear evidence from Mr Bob, Bob Rogers, AFSM, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service Commissioner, and Mr Anthony Clark, the Director of Communications, New South Wales Rural Fire Service. You'll also hear from Ms Kate Fitzgerald, who is the Acting Chief Executive and Deputy Secretary of the Emergency Management Victoria, and Ms Regan Key, Manager, Operational Communications, Emergency Management Victoria. Mr Rogers and Mr Clark from the State of New South Wales will give evidence of emergency warnings and the fires near NEAP, developed by the New South Wales RFS. And Ms Fitzgerald and Ms Regan will give evidence of emergency warnings and the Vic Emergencies app, developed by Emergency Management Victoria. Um, you may recall I said a fair deal about that matter yesterday in my opening, so I won't repeat that today. Uh, you'll also then hear from Mr Andrew Fisher from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, he will give evidence of the role of the ABC in emergency broadcasting and its experience during the 2019-2020 bushfires. I might just deal with the material for tender mm -hmm. and I'll deal with it in the order in which the uh, evidence will come. Uh, the first is uh, the New South Wales Rural Fire Services material. Uh, there are seven items. The first is uh, the notice to give response dated 21 May. That's 14.2.1. The second is another uh, response to a notice to give of 18 May. The third is the statement of Robin Rogers, the New South Wales Commissioner, 25 June. Uh, the next is the warnings and public information protocol of the New South Wales RFS operational protocol. 23 November 2018. Uh, the next is New South Wales Rural Fire Service Fire Danger Rating System and Risk Communications Research from March 2020. Uh, the State Bushfire Plan, a subplan of the State Emergency Management Plan from December 2017. And finally, 14.2.7, the community preparedness and responses to the 2017 New South Wales bushfires research for the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, which was by the uh, Biz, uh, Bushfires and Natural Hazards, CRC. Uh, we might just deal with that tender, Commissioner. Okay, we'll take those documents, 14.2.1 through 14.2.7, uh, as exhibits. In relation to the material from Victoria, I will be deferring part of the tender because there is also, in relation to parts of that material, uh, applications for confidentiality, non-publication orders, uh, based on confidentiality claims and public interest immunity claims. Uh, item 14.3.1 is the Victorian State Response, which includes the Emergency Management Victoria Response dated 1 June 2020. The next is the Victorian Response of 28 May 2020. I'm deferring 14.3.3 and 14.3.4. Uh, I tender 14.3.5, which is the Emergency Management Operational Review of 2015-2016, 14.3.6, the Emergency Management Operational Review 2016-2017, 14.3.7, the Emergency Management Manual, Victoria, from February 2005, 14.3.8, uh, a media release <coughs> of 26 December 2019, and finally, the statement of Kate Fitzgerald, 23 June 2020, that's item 14.3.9. All right, noting the qualifications you had, we'll take those documents as exhibits as well. I also tender item, um, the two items at 14.4, which is provided by Bushfires IO. Uh, it's a statement of Tristan Morris, uh, 24 June 2020, 14.4.1, and the submission of Bushfires IO, 14.4.2, um, 27 April 2020. For reasons of time, we don't um, have time to deal with uh, Bushfires IO today, but we anticipate um, we will have an opportunity to do further uh, in a subsequent hearing. All right, we look forward to talking to them, but we'll take both those documents now as exhibits. <coughs> And finally, Community Broadcasting Association of Australia, it's in the same position, 14.5.1. Um, that's the submission to the Royal Commission of 30 April 2020. 
and we'll take that as marked as an exhibit as well. Thank you. And the last one is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's material, uh, which is for 14.1.1 through to uh, on the amended tender list 14.1.8. That's the ABC's response to a notice to give information of 28 May 2020. Uh, the three annexures uh, to that um, response, the emergency broadcasting policy, the memorandum of understanding of emergency broadcasts on ABC radio and a message coding method. Uh, then 14.1.5 is the ABC bushfire impact research 2019-2020 and the 14.1.6 is the ABC submission to the Royal Commission of April 2020. And then finally, two photographs, 14.1.7 um, and 14.1.8. Both those photographs are reproduced in the notice to give response, but we have better quality versions of them, uh, which we'll um, take you to in the course of the hearing today, uh, Commissioners. Uh, so that's 14.1.1 through to 14.1.8 is the ABC material. And we'll take those <coughs> as well. Thank you. <coughs> and in relation to uh, yesterday's uh, deferred material and today's deferred material um, in relation to the Victorian application, I understand that there is um, correspondence uh, passing between the Royal Commission and the Victorian State Government Solicitor's Office. Uh, we anticipate being in a position to deal with that tomorrow. Okay, we'll res resolve that one tomorrow. Thank you. Excuse me. I call uh, Robin Rogers, Anthony Clark, Kate Fitzgerald and Regan Key. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Mr Rogers, I'll start with you. Uh, Mr Rogers, I'll start with you. I understand you'll take an oath. Mr Rogers, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Uh, Ms Fitzgerald, I understand you'll also take an oath. Ms Fitzgerald, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? That's Sorry, I didn't hear you, Ms Fitzgerald. Uh, we've just had an internet connection issue. Could I ask you to repeat that uh, oath, please? Yes, of course. Miss Fitzgerald, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr Clark, um, I understand you'll take an affirmation. Mr. Clark, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Ms. Key, I understand you've taken affirmation. Ms. Key, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Sorry, I didn't hear you, Miss Key. Thank you. Commissioners, I note in uh, that process that there was some audio delay uh, and mismatch between the visual and the audio coming from the Victorian feed. Uh, we'll monitor that and see if it affects the course of the hearing. Otherwise, we may need to pause. If it does start to affect it, we'll take a short adjournment while we sort it out. Okay. What I might do is start with um, Start with New South Wales, uh, um, Mr. Rogers. Uh, uh, you are the New South Wales Rural Fire Service Commissioner. Uh, you prepared a witness statement uh, dated 25 June 2020. Uh, do you have a copy of that there with you? I do. All right. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? They are. All right. Thank you. Um, there's also two other responses which I may refer from the, um, the New South Wales RFS, which I may refer to in turn during the course of uh, this morning. They will be broadcast, but do you have copies of those available to you as well? Uh, 
I'm not sure if I have the previous notes to give, but I have pretty much, I think, all the material all right. around me. I just don't have Well, as you know, um, our, our practice is to broadcast on screen uh, any, any document that you are referred to, so you should be able to see it. Uh, hopefully be able to see it from where you're sitting uh, in that boardroom. All right. Uh, yes, Mr. should Rod be fine. Thank you, Mr Rogers. Mr Rogers, I just want to understand, um, I appreciate you, you've come into the role of, of Commissioner after 30 April this year. Uh, your previous role was as De Deputy Commissioner, but I understand your official title involved was, was Executive Director of Operations. I, is that like a Chief Operating Officer role? Is, or could you describe to the Commissioner um, Commissioners what that role involved, since I understand you were in it for some 13 years from October 2007? Yes, um, certainly. I, I guess the equivalent would be a chief operating officer. I was responsible for all the external service delivery, so the firefighting, hazard reduction, the staff outside of headquarters, the state operations centre, um, our interactions on development applications, uh, all, all of those sort of, uh, I guess, service delivery to the community uh, side of things. That was essentially my role, aviation, things like that. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm quite across most of those issues. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you, Mr Rogers. Um, I note also that before that, which obviously is going back, back in time a little now, you were the Assistant Commissioner responsible for community safety and operations for a period of about five years. What, what did that role involve? Um, that had more of the... Um, it had pretty much what the operations area was, with the exclusion of um, it had responsibilities for the area of media and community engagement as well, which when it uh, changed to operations, it didn't have those uh, community engagement and media tech protections in it anymore, but it picked up more of the operational focused areas, which it didn't previously have. All right. Um, so RFS New South Wales issues public warnings about bushfires and bushfire threats in New South Wales for the purpose of protecting life and property. Um, as is pointed out in the submission, uh, the response um, by the, by the um, RFS, uh, the Commissioner is mandated to do so by statute uh, under the uh, Rural Fires uh, Service Act. Um, but also because, as you note in your operational protocol, that warnings and public information are a critical component of managing and reducing the impact of emergency incidents. Um, can I just take you now to that operational protocol? Uh, it's RFS 5... Actually, I'm just in it. Mine says it's 5002 004 0009. I just have that reference rechecked, so I'm taking to you to the right document. No, it's RFS 5002 Now, if we can just go to the second page. Thank you for providing this document to us because it does assist us in understanding how and what, what, what is the importance of this um, and how it is um, operationalised in practice. Uh, on the second page, I can see, and I'll bring you in here, Mr. Clark. I see um, uh, that you have had a, uh, had a role in uh, updating this protocol, and ultimately, Mr. Mr. Rogers, uh, you've approved it in 23 May. Um, Mr. Clark, if I could just go to you while we while we're here. Um, your role is Director of Communications, New South Rural Fire Service. Is is is, is that how you came to be involved in preparing this operational protocol? So through, um, through the communication section, which I'm the director of, um, I, I also look after our media and public information effort during major incidents. So working in our state operations centre, managing the, the public liaison section. Um, so we've obviously worked very closely with, um, with staff within the operations area. Um, to develop this document over a number of years. Um, two questions I just want to follow up on that. The first is that it, 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 the rele last release history is 23 November 2018. Uh, is there another version of this uh, un uh, under review or on underway? Uh, no, not at this stage. Right. Uh, you say here... I, think I apologise, I cut you off. Sorry, I, 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 I cut in. Um, I think it's fair to say we're just waiting the outcome of various state inquiries and Royal Commission before we um, commence any reviews. So it's likely it would be changed, but at this point we would think it would be a bit preemptive to do that. All right. Is, is it part... 
Would its review otherwise have been part of any kind of continuous improvement process within RFS New South Wales? So typically that that um, that operational protocol would be reviewed on an annual basis, mm -hmm. um, and obviously, um, as as the commissioner mentioned, um, we're just waiting on you know indications from from this inquiry, the New South Wales inquiry, uh, and indeed our, our own uh, after action reviews and so on to um, to get a future changes to that. Yeah, you've just um, reminded us that it's renewed, on, uh, reviewed on an annual basis. We see here the last version history was November 2018. Was it reviewed uh, in 2019? Uh, look, it, it, it was not reviewed um, around November 2019 because we were already uh, well into the bushfire season at that point. Now, um, Mr Clark, you are... Uh, I read in Mr Rogers' statement, the current chair of the AFAC National Warnings Group. Could you just explain to the commissioners what that is or describe what that what that is, just while I've got you here? Sure. So the, um, the National Warnings Group was, um, was developed in uh, following a, a national review of information and warnings that was conducted back in 2014. Um, and, and just going back a step, obviously, there was... A significant amount of change in the in the public information and warning space following the Black Saturday fires of 2009. Uh, around 2013, 2014, um, there was a view that that was an opportunity to, I suppose, look back at, at where we've come from and where we were at that point. Um, one of the recommendations of that national review that was um, managed by EMV in Victoria uh, was to develop a national warnings group. Um, so that group consists of fire and emergency services from all states and territories. It also includes some Commonwealth agencies, including the Bureau of Meteorology, and uh, also um, some important stakeholders such as researchers from the Queensland University of Technology, the Bushfire CRC, uh, and also the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. We're going to come to the, uh, a particular uh uh, method by which warnings are communicated to the public, which is the, the um, a smartphone device applications. Uh, but is, is, uh, is the development of applications like that coordinated uh, through that national warnings group? Um, look, not not necessarily coordinated, but but it is certainly uh, something that the, the group does pay a lot of attention to and uh, has regular um, discussions about including the consistency of, of, of data. Um, you know, the, the the bushfire warnings framework and frameworks for other hazards as well, um, and, and also consistency of, of tools like emergency alert, the telephone warning system, social media, and, and so on. All right. Can we go to uh, 0019 in that document? I'll just uh, take you and the Commissioner uh, to... This is the Bushfire Warnings and Information Framework in New South Wales. And just uh, we're noting that there's a scaled system of warning and information use for bushfires. Um, if we go down to the uh, panel, the, the three alert levels used for bushfire incidents in New South Wales... Um, we've had some evidence to the Commission and also references and submissions about uh, different perceptions of the meanings of these alert levels, um, and in particular, watch and act. What's the current status of review uh, and uh, our position on the, continu the continuation of these alert levels on a national basis, Mr Clark? Sure. So uh, I, I suppose just a, an important um, point of clarification, the, the alert levels and the icons that you're referring to there, they were the uh, the icons and the, the terminology that was agreed to in 2009 following the Black Saturday bushfires in Victoria, yep. and the National Bushfire um, Warnings Framework, so the scale system that you refer to was introduced in 2009 and that consisted of advice, watch and act and emergency warning, um, those community messages, but also the um, the, the icons, the colours and, and so on. So um, over, the, over the past 18 months or so, there's been a significant body of national work through the National Warnings Group to, um, to drive consistency in terminology and icons and the display of this information 
across a number of hazards, so particularly five hazards, bushfire, flood, severe storm, extreme heat and cyclone. There's been a significant national research project undertaken to um, drive that consistency and, and seek the community's input on that. Because I think acknowledging back in 2009, um, the industry did pretty incredible work under intense um, pressure and, and shortened timeframes to get this in place um, following the fires in February uh, and then have that in place for the 2010-11 the bushfire season. Um, but I, I think we've acknowledged that that work was done very quickly uh, with great collaboration across the country, but uh, with very little community input. So we've recognised now that there is an opportunity to uh, get the community's views on the warnings framework and, and the terminology and the icons and, and so on. So that research has, um, I suppose, centred on you know, icons, the, the colours, but the, the term watch and act um, continues to be um, one of those um, wicked problems, I, I suppose, because um, there, there has been some evidence that Watch and Act, while it has a, a fairly high degree of um, recall within the community, about two-thirds of people recall the term Watch and Act, um, the research that we have done through that National Warnings Group does also show that there is a, a fair degree of confusion within the community. And, and to put it pretty simply, um, the, the views that we got through focus group testing and so on was that it seemed to be a bit of a get each way, both watch and act. So that's one of the, the things that we've been um, trying to resolve through that national research. And we've been progressing a proposed Australian warning system consisting of those consistent um, icons, colours and the alert levels. And um, through the commissioners and chief officers strategic committee um, that has been uh, endorsed in principle with the exception of that middle level um, and we're currently embarking on another round of research in the next couple of weeks um, to hopefully land on a definitive answer on that middle level. But as I said, it is one of those... Mr Clark, uh, can, I just, can I just interrupt you there? Um, the commissioners, commissioners has received some evidence of community perception as to watch and act. Does it mean... Um, I'll stay and watch, or should I act and go, um, to sum it up. Uh, what's the concern that... What, what's thought, thought to be achieved by getting yet more research? Well, um, I, I think it's it's important to recognise that the, the research isn't just looking at the, the term watch and act, but it's looking at the entire warning system. And uh, an important aspect of that is the development of action statements, which would sit alongside that. So um, whether that middle level ends up being watch and act or a term like act now, um, there would also be a clear action statement that sits alongside that. So it could be something like um, seek shelter now, it could be leave now um, or, or prepare to leave, for instance. So um, it, it's important to recognise that it, it's, it's not just simply focused on that terminology, but the entire system and, and how these ingredients all work together, including those action statements, is, which is, we believe will will actually address some of that confusion. Uh, I'll, I'll go to Victoria in just a moment, but is, is has there been any advice received by the National Warnings Group um, or, or fed up through the National Warnings Group uh, to the COSC uh, uh, that, that this current alert system does not sufficiently communicate increasing or elevated sense of risk? That is, it's not seeking to affect behaviour in a direct way? Uh, sorry, uh, can, can you repeat that question? Well, I think what you you earlier said that there was a, the, the aim is to obtain some kind of nationally consistent warning framework that has community support. And you mentioned that when this was first developed uh, post the Bushfires Royal Commission in 2009, that it wasn't done with community input or wasn't done with a significant level of community input. I, 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 don't, I don't need to quibble that aspect. But is, is, is this... Um, is what the warnings research... Sorry, what the warnings group um, uh, concern is to ensure that what it will do is clearly telegraph to the community the risk that they are exposed to 
and what they must do in response to that assessment of risk? Absolutely. That um, there's the, the research has shown that there's overwhelming community support for um, for consistency, and by making these changes, and, and it has been tested um, different terms and, and different combinations of, of terms. Um, and, and the research shows that um, if, if this was to occur, we're more likely to get the, the action that we're actually looking for from the community during emergency events. All right. Um, I'll just go now to... Can I just ask a question? Oh. Yes, Chair. Sorry. Yes. Um, sorry, Mr Clark. I just, um, I just have a question. I, I heard you say that um, post the 2009 fires, you got an, a, a warning system in place for 2010, 2011, which was quite quick. Um, because of the urgency of doing it. My understanding is that this work to look at fixing this up started in 2016 and that it's not anticipated to be brought into play until 2022. We know that there's a lot of confusion out there in the community as to what what these mean and what they're, what they're seeking to convey. Can you please explain to me why it takes that many years? I mean... We know there's confusion, and if you, you, you change it and then you educate people, I don't see what, what um, you, to, as to what the agreed terms are. It, I must say, for my part, I find it breathtaking that it takes that many years to come up with something where you know there's confusion. You know that. And yet, year after year, people are being exposed to um, uh, natural disasters and fires in particular, where they have no idea what they're meant to do under this system. Can you please explain to me why it is still, even now, not proposed to come until 2022? I'm sorry. So what, what I would say is that um, with, with the exception of that that middle level and the um, the, the last piece of the puzzle with that, uh, that research, we're, we're probably at about 95% of, of the way there at the moment and acknowledging it, it's, it's been a, a pretty significant undertaking by um, all of the states and territories and, and the agencies over that time. I think I think there is an acceptance within the the industry that this is work that um, we certainly wish um, you know could happen much faster. Um, but uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate, um, national collaboration sometimes takes quite some, some time. But well, maybe it does. I'm sorry to interrupt it, you, Mr Clark. Maybe it takes time. I understand that. But, I mean, from 2016 to 2022, after the last bushfires, if you could get it in for the 2010-11 bushfire season from 2009 because you realised there was urgency, I do not comprehend how you can still... how There can be any view anywhere in the country that this can wait until 2022. I simply don't understand it. I don't see why there isn't a sense of urgency right now to get it in for the next bushfire season. Could I just add something, Commissioner, if, if I may? By all means. I think the, the difference in the 2009 scenario was it was simply aligning the national fire agencies for fire warnings. The, the, the work that's talking here is multi-hazard warnings and having something consistent across the country. The difficulty is, for example, in some of the um, SES environments, floods and the like, they're not even consistent amongst that hazard across the country. So that's the that's the complex body of work that Mr Clark's trying to, um, I guess, work with the representatives to, to bring in. If I also might say about the, 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 the complexity also in that middle level is that it's not a simple action statement as in one size fits all because individuals are in very unique circumstances and their action, even though they're in the same catchment, their action may be different depending on their particular circumstances, particularly at that middle level. I, and I think that's the that makes it so much more complex. You know something, I understand that there may be some complexities and I'm certainly not looking just at New South Wales for this because I understand that there's an attempt to do this nationally. So you just happen to be the people who are talking about it right now. But you've had, you plural, everybody, has had four years to get this going, and you're proposing another two to three years to get it up there. I don't care how... I mean, I don't... 
I'm, I'm sure that there are things of much greater complexity that can be resolved in a shorter time period. And this, the, I mean, this is not with great respect. I understand there might be various things about it, but you know what the problems are. You know what the community concerns are. You know what the issues are. We are, we are talking about three sets of words here. We're not talking about a major treaty between two nations of, of multiple multifactorial outcomes. We are talking about something that is really reasonably straightforward. I understand it might have complex inputs and you've had all the research. What I do not comprehend is how anybody nationally can say that this can wait until 2022. I, I, I think on that, on that point, what, what I would offer is um, that that middle level, um, we we know that there is a degree of community um, concern or, or confusion around that. But I think we we want to get it right, and we need to get it right. And we we've, we've often spoken about ensuring that we have got the compelling case for change and having the right words that we know will get the right response from the community. And it, it has taken some time to, to get to that point and it remains the, the only outstanding point in the development of a, of a national warning system across all of these hazards that I spoke to. Um, it, it, I, I think we, we would not want to repeat, you know, the, the, um, the work of, of 2009 without making sure that we're talking to the community about getting those words right so that we get the right response from the community during an incident. I don't think I can, I don't think I can take it any further. Thank you. No. Do you provide comment on that, Commissioner? I'm sorry? Yes, I was Victoria gonna... provide some further comment on that? Yes, please. Uh, I, I certainly support... I certainly support our New South Wales colleagues' uh, advice on this front. Uh, I would also suggest that the 2022 deadline, I guess that just that a deadline would need to have this implemented by, uh, given that the uh, research will be completed in the coming weeks. I would certainly see that the bushfire agencies would move to adopt the new framework as soon as possible. And I'd say that that would be representative across the country and representative of Victoria's approach. And I would argue New South Wales's approach as well. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> Just trying to move papers across the table. Sorry, Commissioners. Um, Sorry, Commissioners, we were trying to have a, pay, a document turned up, but we might just have to return to it. I am sorry for the, for, no, if no. I took you off your, off your line of thought, Ms. Hogan. Uh, no, no. Uh, the, um, uh, I do have a fair um, number of matters I do need to cover in addition to uh, this topic. Uh, so perhaps we might, if we may, just put that topic to one side uh, and perhaps we might go to all the states and territories in relation to this issue and come back to you, Commissioners. Would that be of assistance? Yes. Uh, could we go to page 0025 uh, and in the same document in the operation protocol, what I want to move now to and the time available is to the, app, is to the smartphone apps. Um, we can see there the smartphone application uh, considerations. Um, New South Wales has the fires near me application. At the bottom it says it raises two matters for consideration. I think, um, in fairness, uh, um, the two, uh, these are not considerations, these are indeed limitations. Uh, the first is that smartphone applications, including fires near me, are reliant on data coverage and can be prone to infrastructure failure. That was, uh, Ms. Mr Rogers, Mr Clark, something you saw happen in the 2019-2020 bushfire season, no doubt. Correct. Right. Uh, and that not all members of the community have online access. Also an, an issue not just because of impact of fire, but because they don't have it either because of their socioeconomic circumstances or perhaps because of their age. They don't use um, online uh, services. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, we, we do get feedback that there's still that element of people that do rely on you know, landline telephones um, that, that don't even have mobile phones at all, let alone basic versions of mobile phone, non-smartphones. Now, um, I won't take you to these documents because I don't have time, uh, but I'm going to read it to the record. In the uh, 
RFS New South Wales response, uh, uh, the first response, uh, it is noted that the public acceptance and level of use of the Fires Near Me app was extraordinary in the last fire season. Um, could I just ask that of, of uh, Ms Fitzgerald? I know I'm bouncing to you without notice, but did you find that same experience of the Emergency Victoria app, uh, Vic Emergency, in the, in, the, in the last fire season, that there was an extraordinary use over and above previous, uh, previous natural disasters? Perhaps Ms Key might be in a better position to answer that. That's... Um, uh, yeah, we did. Ms Key can sort of go to the numbers, but, yes, that is correct. We saw um, extraordinary jumps in the numbers of the use of uh, Vic Emergency app and also the Vic Emergency website. Cool. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, our usage jumped by 800,000 users and we do see those peaks over each summer uh, as in other types of emergencies. We've seen uh, further growth currently with the COVID pandemic. All right. Um, the, uh, if I could just compare and contrast, because I've, the time is, is a little limited, um, if I can just compare and contrast the apps. The New South Wales app is just bushfires. That's right, Mr Rogers. It's not an all-hazards app. It's, it's fires. It covers fires in New South Wales. Sorry, you're quite right. It's not, not just, just bushfires. Fire. Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, Ms Fitzgerald, whereas the Victorian uh, Vic Emergency app is an all-hazards map, what, what other kind of hazards is it capturing? Floods, cyclones? Well, I suppose not in Victoria, but... Uh, yes, that's correct. It, um, it does. We do have many tornadoes, though, so it does uh, it does cover um, floods right through to pandemics. So, as uh, Ms. Key said, we're using it currently for COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. uh, it includes um, things like industrial accidents, uh, human cause incidents, uh, shark sightings. Essentially, the whole range of new emerging agencies um, that potentially, you know, we haven't used it for previously as well. All right. Now, there was quite some interruption uh, in that answer that you gave. I think we have the part of the gist of it. Yes, thank you. Uh, we're OK. We've got the, All right. the, the flow. Um, Ms Fitzgerald, uh, you describe in the statement that the Victorian app is designed and operates as a decision-making tool, that it is designed to be used by members of the community to make decisions having having received that information. Um, could you just explain to the commissioners what that means and what consequence that has for the utility of the app? Yes, that's correct. So the development of the Vic Emergency app um, came out of the two 2009 bushfires and also other further reviews that we've had in Victoria, including the Hazelwood Mine uh, Fire Inquiry. It's intended to provide um, timely, relevant and reliable information and warnings to members of the community um, as an authoritative source on all emergencies and incidents, as I've just outlined. So it really is designed uh, and, it's, and it's aligned with um, Victoria's state emergency management priorities to enable decisions and actions to be taken by community members. So we spend a lot of um, time and consideration um, both uh, before and during emergencies to ensure that the information that we are providing, um, both on the Vic Emergency um, app, but also our broader warnings platform to enable people to make appropriate decisions for them based on their localised situation. Um, I'll take uh, New South Wales to their research in a moment, but has Victorian Emergency commissioned any um, research in relation to the... Um, the utility or issues that the community has in relation to the Vic Emergency app? Um, I'll, I'll ask uh, Ms Key to um, comment on the research, but I'd just say in relation to feedback, so we do obviously receive feedback on the app from community members. Um, a lot of that goes to, you know, normal sort of user functionality in relation to the use of the app. But we um, are in a process of continual improvement in relation to the Vic Emergency app and we use the findings of reviews and inquiries, also community meetings, the feedback that we get through our social media channels um, and also, um, you know, through uh, media as well in relation, to, um, in relation to warnings that we are providing during emergencies to make sure that we're sort of actively addressing issues um, during an emergency. And then obviously after an emergency, we sort of comprehensively bring that into our, our business to ensure that we're... Um, 
you know, updating and improving our broader information and warnings platform. But Ms. Key, I might ask you to comment on the research aspect of that question. There's no specific research that has been driven in Victoria. Uh, most of our work has been with the Bushfire Natural Hazards CRC in testing our platforms in response to a national approach. So uh, that's sort of been the, the focus over the last five years while the app has been in place. All right. Could I just... Um... All right. Uh, I might just leave you, therefore, uh, and go back to New South Wales and have RFS 5002-0004-0684 shown. Um, and while that's being brought up, I just, I'll ask you, um, I think I'll go to you, Mr Rogers. Um, you've just heard what Ms uh, Fitzgerald said in relation to the app being designed as a decision-making tool. There's... Um, uh, as I understood it from the RFS New South Wales response, um, it's not designed, the uh, uh, fires near me is not designed to be a standalone source of information or a decision making tool. Um, uh, is that right? And if so, why? Well, I think it's fair to say it's not, it's, it was never designed to be a decision making tool in isolation. And that, that's the point. I mean, it, it would all obviously contribute to a decision. But, um, but we rely on people to, you know, because fires change so quickly, we also say to people that by the time maps are updated, things can change. And that's why we say listen to local radio, uh, make sure you don't have one source of information. And we still stand by that because things can change very, very quickly. Um, and spot fires can move very fast, well ahead of the main fire front. So the situation is very fluid. So that's, I guess that's our point. But... What we have found um, over this season is that um, people are using it as a single source. Um, and I think uh, in my statement, I make mention of that, that, um, you know, while people, well, we still don't advocate it should be a single source, we accept that that's what people are doing and hence we're doing quite a number of adjustments to improve the uh, timeliness and accuracy of mapping because the mapping itself is, um, is something that people are are using, um, you know, significantly. So you've got a polygon of a fire, and if that doesn't get updated uh, rapidly, then people are making decisions on information that might be three or four hours old. I, I, I note your point about timeliness, and that was one of the matters that you received feedback on. RFS, uh, if we go to 0710, uh, with the specific comments on fires near me app in that first block, uh, some participants some participants raised that information was delayed causing frustration just in that first uh, paragraph at the top. Um, that seems to be uh, the only, uh, um, if I might say, negative feedback and you've just noted that there's steps underway to address the timeliness and the, and the accuracy of the information. Um, uh, that research, was that the only thing that was communicated to you through this research project in relation to um, negative aspects or, or shortcomings of the fires near me app? It seems to be the only one that's recorded. Yeah. No, I mean, there, there certainly was anecdotal information of, of people, but um, I've got to say, by and large, uh, we have extremely positive feedback on the app. Um, we've had record numbers of downloads and people accessing it. And that's why um, when we've realised the reliance people have, that we've spoken to government and indeed governments invested significantly in um, mapping aircraft to make sure we can map these fires as much quicker. Uh, so we can provide much more accurate information. And because at the end of the day, everything relies about having the right map in, in our systems that these applications take the, whether you're accessing it through a website or, or an app, you need to have an accurate fire map um, and, and obviously where people understand where the risks are and there's some of the uh, improvements to the app that we've outlined and then some of that uh, back-end mapping information so that we can uh, provide that more timely and accurate mapping. Um uh, I might just ask Mr Clark. Mr Clark, were you involved in commissioning this? Is this, is this within your sort of directorate, so to speak? 
Yes, that is that is correct. All right. I might ask you, therefore, about the research approach. What, the one aspect of feedback that doesn't emerge from this document is a, an issue uh, that the result, as a, that the fires are not mapped across state borders in the fires near me application. Um, uh, just we can go to page zero six eight eight and identify the location of where groups that were participated is in this research. Uh, project. None of them appear to be com um, border communities, either in the south or the north. Do you think that might have affected the feedback? And there uh, doesn't seem to be well, anybody. I, I, there also uh, doesn't seem to be anybody. F well, it's not identified as including anybody from interstate. So no. So the the research was conducted within New South Wales, but but just a, a point of clarity on on this research. This was uh, designed to be. A, a very quick run of research in, in the immediate weeks after the, the fire season. Um, we are already underway with a much larger, much more significant research project through the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, um, which is what we typically do after most major, major bushfire events. Uh, and that consists of uh, online and community research. Um, but appreciating um, it's been very difficult to, to go out and do that research with um, with the situation with COVID-19. So um, it is it is happening a little bit later than what we would have liked, but that research will indeed focus on those border areas and getting feedback as well. Um, this app is not just used by members of the community, it's also used by volunteers, those who are um, assisting the Rural Fire Service uh, as volunteer firefighters and responders and support network as well. Is that correct, Mr Rogers? Um, possibly, but, but but firefighters also have access to corporate systems where they can look at uh, progression of fires, um, a common operating picture that they they can have logins to. So right. they don't, you know, they 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 ought not to be relying simply on the app as well. They do have access to other information, and and that includes people who are actually on the fire ground. Is it correct? I see. If they if they are obviously through a through a um, a device. Um, they can gain access to uh, mapping, the same mapping that we have at a state level or an incident management team level. Um, Mr Clark, also I just noticed at 0694, um, no one was actively involved with the emergency services was included in the, uh, uh, in the people providing feedback for this research uh, project. Uh, do you know why that was? Um, because this was focused on the community, um, accepting the views of the community, um, so we we very deliberately exclude people who have a very close link um, to to emergency services because they obviously have a significant amount of, of knowledge already in this space. All right. Um, could I have shown uh, RCN nine hundred zero three eight triple zero three triple zero two? I'm sorry. RCN 900-038-0002, which is from the, um, yesterday's opening, the Bushfires History Project uh, PowerPoint. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do, Operator, is show, and just to gain time, if you can show the Fires Near Me app and the Victorian Emergency app up against each other, if that can be done. I was told it could be, but it might just be a little, a little tricky. Um, the Commissioners probably can remember. Oh, here it is. Um, the fires near me app, uh, and uh, at least on this, this one doesn't capture the border area. The Victorian one does capture the border area. It has some information across the border, but certainly not the detail of information that there is on the border. Cutting to the chase, to both of you, what's being done to, for the next fire season to have an app that will give people on either side of the border or who need to evacuate from one side of the border to the other or are travelling interstate because it's Christmas holidays, a picture of the situation that they confront. Who wants to go first? Uh, I, well, I'm, I'm happy to talk. I mean, we, we've already committed that um, we believe that the solution there is to uh, capture data on, uh, you know, for example, it's been said 50 kilometres across the border into uh, for, from New South Wales, for example, into Victoria. Uh, and but, but I guess what we've got to just work through with Victoria, for example, is making sure we're, we're 
um, representing their incidents in the way that they want it to be represented because um, and, and these things can change so quickly and, and that's the difficulty of of like the risk itself is very much depending on topography as opposed to state borders but the management of the fire is obviously being done by by a particular state and strategies for that fire have a direct influence on the risk to the community so it's it's a i guess a simple case of saying we should replicate what's going on across the border but we as i say we've just got to make sure we do that in a way that the agency responsible for that fire and the management uh, has comfort in. So whether it's taking a feed from the app itself, for, for MARFS taking it from the Victorian app, or um, if, if that's the best way, but certainly we think that's the quickest and easiest way to get uh, the clarity on the border issue in time for you know the next bushfire season. When does the next bushfire season start? Well, I mean, it can. To be honest, I mean, it can start in the northern part of New South Wales in August. But uh, obviously, the peak areas um, are really when you start getting into October, November, December is where it starts becoming hotter. Um, but um, certainly, the quantity of fires we can have in August. But um, but obviously, the peak is is where we're talking about here. Uh, you, you've said that. I think for what you've you've told me is that there is a plan to have it in uh, in place for the commencement of the next fire season or at least some point in the next fire season. Is, is that a fair sum, summary of your evidence, Mr Rogers? Yes, subject to us being able to simply take the data. I, I don't understand the complexities of this. I'm not a technical person, but um, it, 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 certainly for someone fairly uh, simplistic as far as technology, I don't see why it would be that complex, um, albeit um, I think part of the issue certainly between Victoria and New South Wales, is different um, use of icons, um, which I guess that's something we have to resolve because if you're, you're displaying things on um, across the border, um, which icon are you using and to, to make sure that people understand it. So I think there's some simple things like that we need to work through, but um, subject to the data being able to be easily imported, then um, it ought to be done in a, in a you know, and as quick as possible. Just, and before I go to Victoria, the two last questions. Um, it says that um, in, the res in one part of the response by the RFS that there's no current intention to expand the capabilities, the capabilities of the app to other national disasters or emergency situations, by which I understand to mean there's no current intention to expand it to an all-hazards kind of um, uh, warning app in the way that the Victorians have. Is, is that how I, I'm to understand that response? Well, that, that's currently the arrangement within New South Wales um, for, from our app. Um, and I guess the difficulty we have in, in respect to all of these things is the more information you have, the more complexity it is, the longer time lag to get changes done. What we found has been quite a success of um, our app is that we've been able to develop it in a quite a dynamic way and making sure that we're doing things in response to um, what what the community wants. I've got to say, we have not had uh, representations to us um, about that there's a massive inadequacy because it doesn't do all hazards. Um, most of the cases, people that access this information are people that particularly want bushfire information. So, uh, as I say, I'm not casting any, any, you know, on Victoria what they do. I'm just saying in New South Wales, that's the feedback we've had. Um, someone that has a, lives in a ma major bushfire hazard wants very focused information. Uh, they are... want push notification on that hazard. I see. Um, so, they, so someone, for example, who lives in the, uh, the uh, north of New South Wales um, or the south, of, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure what the position is in Queensland, but the north of New South Wales who is exposed to both fires and floods has to have, will have to have two different apps in the coming next summer season. Is that right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, they would. Now, if I can go to Victoria, um, uh, is there a plan that you're aware um, with New South Wales or within Victoria itself to uh, provide information to those people who uh, need to, um, uh, who are on either side of the border or who need to evacuate from one side of the border to the other or who are travelling interstate because it's Christmas holidays, a picture of the situation that they will confront? I can see there's some information about New South Wales on that um, Vic, Vic emergency app. Ms Fitzgerald? 
Yes, uh, thanks, Ms Hogan-Doran. And please let me know if uh, you can't hear me uh, again. But uh, so I think... Uh, point I'll probably just make in relation to this is that currently we go 50 kilometres um, across the border uh, in both New South Wales. So we draw on the New South Wales RFS data and we also go 50 kilometres across the border in relation to South Australia as well. So we draw upon the country fire service um, data from that side. The, the three um, key areas of focus for us uh, prior to the next um, summer season um, or the next bushfire season include, um, I think, specifically this issue of how we achieve consistency in relation to um, the, the symbols and um, between New South Wales, or well, between all jurisdictions, but obviously um, between New South Wales and Victoria so that um, there is that, you know, people have that ability to be able to sort of see um, the same symbols appear on both sides of the border, so there's quite quite an important piece of work we consider needs to occur prior to next summer season. The other aspect that we are currently piloting at the moment and we think will be extremely useful on these cross-border communities in particular is um, localised pages um, and that allows for much more detailed localised information and um, so you could um, more, you know, provide much more sort of tailored local information for those cross-border communities to de-conflict um, uh, de-conflict, I suppose, messaging and also increase that sort of consistency and clarity around messaging as well. So we're piloting at the, that at the moment and we'd, and we'd obviously be prioritising that, particularly within, um, you know, cross-border communities. The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, it is concern, obviously, to us that, um, that there appears to be... Um, uh, you know, a level of frustration and confusion from community members on within. Oh, you've just broken up. We've lost, uh, it's frozen. Our feed from Victoria has frozen. In fact, I think it's now gone. Uh, and we'll see if that can be re-established. Um, so while we do that, we've got a couple of questions for New South Wales. If that... Uh, of course. I'll tell you what, we'll give well, 30, 30 seconds to get Victoria for back. For Victoria to hear what is uh, answered? Not really. It's more of a question for... Because it's more down an all-hazards oh. route, which Victoria is, is talking about. But um, a, a, a couple of questions, and this one could be Victoria as well, but we've got New South Wales on the, the line. If, if Mr Clark, I understand where the new warning system is going, in fact, where the current one sits. Well, Victoria's back. I'll, I'll ask the question anyway. Is uh, it, it requires? We can see you waving. It requires uh, the onus at, uh, for the action is on the uh, the individuals in the community to make those decisions to to uh, to, to follow what the the uh, the warning system might provide. Now, timely decisions require timely information, and. Uh, and I know um, from Mr Rogers was talking about the timeliness of the current uh, inf information that is there. Um, I guess a, a, a couple of questions for that. If New South Wales has access to timely information, i.e. the firefighters got access to the timely information, why couldn't you make that available to the public on the app? Uh, effectively, that, that same information. So when when... When, a, when an incident is mapped for firefighters, it is the same data that ends up being displayed to the community. It is the same map. OK, so I'm looking on, and I can't find it in your submission at the moment, but some of the updates are hours old. So the community has hours old information. So what you're saying is actually the firefighters have got hours old mapped information uh, as well. So looking to the future where, again, the the common warning system that's being developed relies on the community to have timely information. Is there an upgrade path to get that information more timely for the community and obviously the firefighters as well? Yeah, if I, if I may, Commissioner, just to address that. So um, putting just the context of um, this last season, we had more than 120 fires burning at any one time across the state. You have these fires often joining and, and forming significantly large fires and trying to get uh, situational awareness from the fire ground on the whole fire 
uh, and in, you know, in a, in a really dynamic sense of where it's spotting, where the threats are, um, is extremely challenging. And the only reliable way for us to do that um, consistently is by air. So that re relies on aircraft flying over these fires, uh, taking images, downloading them to uh, our systems, and therefore we have very accurate maps. And what the um, what what we found was that the uh, load on those aircraft um, across this last fire season uh, meant that we were getting one or two um, at best uh, images of that uh, per day. So you know something that was inputted in the morning. Um, will have changed significantly by the afternoon, but we may not have an updated map because that incident management team just is not across because they've got so many fires, they're just not able to map them all accurately and uh, and therefore that, become, that becomes a huge risk for both the agency and, and the community in not knowing exactly where those fires is. Hence why the government's invested and we, we've bought two aircraft dedicated uh, that we own, uh, that we're bringing on for this next fire season, and they will um, be able to fly over, map those fires. And what we're doing is uh, the current system relies on data coming into our state operations centre, a GIS operator, looking at that data, manipulating it, doing some uh, interesting technological things, and then inputting it. What we're looking at is getting to a point where as soon as that's downloaded from an aircraft, it's straight into our system and therefore flows straight through our operational systems through to fires near me. So, and then, and then time stamping exactly when that was accurate um, on, the, on the app itself so that the community has some understanding of exactly when that image was taken and, and obviously um, where that fire was at that time. So that's a, that's a work in progress, but the good intel from the fire ground is what's really needed to provide better intelligence to the community. OK, and I appreciate that, I know, and I understand the technological issues behind it. And I've got a, a few more questions. I've got one more for Mr Rogers, and I'll go back to Ms Hogan Doran to finish with Victoria, and then we've got... There are a few questions across the, the commissioners. Um, being an avid user of your app, living in New South Wales, uh, there was a period there where, where the fires in Victoria, the Malakuta burn scar, was actually on fires near me. Now, we discussed it, a couple of other avid users. It appeared it was only for a day, maybe less, but it did have the Malakuta fires on the Fires Near Me app, or at least the burn scar uh, of it. Was that just an avid uh, analyst in New South Wales that put that on there, or were you drawing off information, or what, why was it on very briefly, and then why did it disappear? I actually don't know specifically that instance. The only thing that uh, I could uh, surmise would be that that fire had moved across the border and therefore it became a fire we were both managing so that that uh, polygon of the fire was needed to be put across um, both states so that our incident management team and then indeed obviously uh, as Mr Clark said that the, that goes through the fires near me app then uh, gets that same feed so that's the only thing I can um, guess but I can come back to you if you wish. No that's okay I think you answered it about what where it's drawing that information from. Okay, thank you. Now, we'll have a few more questions in a minute, but we'll go back to Ms Hogan Doran to, to keep going. Uh, I, I just, in light of the time, I'll just have one question uh, and then uh, back to you, Commissioners. Um, yesterday we heard some evidence from the cross-border commissioners about interjurisdictional committees, uh, and Mr McTavish, the New South Wales cross-border commissioner, uh, said that there was an... Upper Murray RFS and CFA committee, an Eastern Cross Border committee uh, between RFS and CFA, and a tri state working group in the southwest of New South Wales, which all incorporates New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australian Emergency Services and Ambulance. I'm trying to understand, at least in relation to communications, is there a committee or some kind of working group or some way in which New South Wales talks to Victoria, including about these apps and these commu communication of warnings? There's certainly, obviously, um, localised cross-border meetings and agreements, and, and as well as, uh, obviously, MOUs between different states and territories. But AFAC is very much the uh, body that very much facilitates that connectivity and, and, in, uh, and, I guess, discussions between states and territories. There's no other specific one? No, I, I mean... But particularly through, as I mentioned earlier, the, the National Warnings Group, this is something that um, is 
discussed from time to time. I, I think um, one of the, the key things, though, that I would highlight is that um, cross, cross-border information and things like you know, apps across the, the broader country are, are reliant on consistent data um, and ensuring <coughs> that you know, those icons are, are the same, incidents are being mapped the same, incidents are being labelled the same, um, and that is certainly a, a focus of the, that national research and, and ultimately building data standards to ensure that there is that consistency across the country and, most importantly, across those border areas as well. So I, I expect that to be um, one of the, the key outcomes of the national warning system, so getting consistent data standards. I didn't hear from you, Mr Clark, that you and Ms Key sit on a committee together. I don't understand Ms Key to be sitting on the uh, AFAC National Warnings Group. Uh, Ms Key, I might go to you. Uh, are you able to assist the commissioners to identify if there is um, something that you work with New South Wales in relation to the messaging uh, and warnings provided to the community and also to emergency responders to the extent they use um, these sort of apps and online information? Yes, Ms Hogan Doran. Uh, I was the inaugural chair of the AFAC Warnings Group in 2015-16 and Anthony, uh, Mr Clark actually took over from me as the chair. So uh, we uh, speak quite often about the um, issues pertaining to warnings and public information across our borders and what's occurring in our states. All right. Um, Ms Fitzgerald, you were cut off before when you were giving an answer uh, and I can remind you because I have the, uh, the real-time transcript and I, I want to give you an opportunity to complete it if there was anything in addition you wanted to say. You were um, identifying a level of frustration and confusion from community members within and then you broke up and I'm not sure if that gives you enough context. I might need to go back a little bit more. You were speaking about piloting... Uh, some uh, some work at the moment and tailoring, providing detailed localised information. Does that assist you in uh, perhaps taking the ball again and running? It does, thank you. And with apologies to the Commission for our IT issues today. Um, the, the only other point I was going to make was just that the other, um, the other area where we are hoping to get some really rich feedback um, from community members for improvement prior to next season is through the Inspector General of Emergency Management who's currently conducting a review into the 2019 20 fires. So we use the findings and observations and insights of the, um, the Inspector General um, very comprehensively to consider about what actions we need to take prior to the next summer season. So that's the other thing we'll be focused on um, over the coming months. Thanks, Ms Fitzgerald. Do you have an indication as to when you expect to receive the report of the Inspector General? Yes, so the Inspector General is due to report to government on the preparedness and response to the 2019 bushfires, uh, 20 bushfires, um, by the 31st of July. Um, and so we'll, the government will receive his response at that stage. I see. And um, is there any practice of providing interim recommendations, for example, for circumstances where things need to be put in place or actioned ahead of the fire season in a timely way? That's right, and, and indeed, actually, um, the Inspector General's report uh, or review is actually, there's two phases to it. So phase one, which is due to be provided to government on the 31st of July, is intended to do directly that, to identify what actions need to occur prior to the 1920, uh, prior to the 2021 season, rather. And then phase two of the Inspector General's report will go to uh, relief and recovery matters um, and any other broader matters, and that will be provided to um, government on the 30th of June. June 2021. Uh, Commissioners, I note the time. I know you have some questions. The only other topic I was going to raise was the extent they work with the ABC, but it's a matter of... We can work with that with the ABC, I think. Thank you. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Um, we've just discussed about the work plan around the harmonisation of the warning systems. Um, in the RFS documents, there's also discussion of how during the fire season there was the inconsistent application of different levels across the border. I just wondered whether one or both of you could talk at that and tell us whether there is a process to resolve that. So by that I mean, I can see it turning ahead, Mr Rogers, um, instances where a particular incident was rated as watch and act and then over the border it was rated as emergency level. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that, Commissioner. Uh, and that's very much the nature of these fires that travel across the border. 
um, because at the end of the day, let's say, for example, a fire that's travelling from New South Wales under a northwesterly wind into Victoria, um, it may well be in quite remote area in New South Wales and posing no threat to any community in New South Wales, but, but downstream, when it crosses the border into Victoria, there may be a town in front of it. So for the communities around New South Wales, there's no risk from that fire in the example I've given. But certainly that, that's not the case in Victoria. So I think it's quite logical and common sense to have um, the risk um, highlighted as far as what, what's at risk from that fire. Um, and that may result in different levels of warning across state borders. I mean, and, and so and I, and I think that's that's actually correct. And that's the way it should be. Even though in your submission you tell us that that results in confusion amongst the communities? Well, it, it does if you don't um, target it and support it with uh, targeted messaging. So that, that's where the particular messaging needs to come in place so that, you know, there might be a fire of a certain size, but the communities directly in, threatened are, you know, whatever they may be, which may be in a different state. But you could have the same thing. Um, in, and we indeed we had that where there was uh, massive fires burning in just in New South Wales and they're burning in west of the ranges and the east of the ranges. But the threat to those communities is very, very different depending on what part of the fire you're near. And I think that's just simply carries across borders. So whilst I accept that, um, you know, there, there could be a level of confusion, we've already identified, the, uh, I think, our app as far as further developments, and I think Victoria does this, um, identifies the actual area at risk from that fire. And I think that's what we started to do throughout the fire season where we put out the maps ahead of the next day of where we were concerned, the prediction maps. And that's really what we've got to focus on. The polygon of the fire is one part. Oh, of the fire. What that fire is going to do in coming hours is the real risk. Right. Well, uh, let me then ask this a, a sort of a slightly different way. Is the holy grail in the space, particularly for apps, a, a national all-hazards app that provides consistent messaging regardless of where you are? Well, I, I would suggest to you that um, if, 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 and, uh, you know, I note the frustration at trying to get every state and territory to agree on simply what we call something, try bringing in one national uh, app that every state and territory agrees to and, and still is able to uh, develop that, having needs of, of its particular state and territory, then uh, it does sound like... Uh, more than a holy grail, to be honest, because I, I would suggest that uh, we risk becoming then um, something mud in quagmire of, of, you know, different states and territories trying to get agreement. Uh, at the moment, at the end of the day, the, these hazards and the warning to the communities of these hazards uh, are the responsibility of, of jurisdictions, however they arrange themselves. And um, and that's obviously what we focus. And I've got to say, we certainly haven't had overwhelming evidence to us. Uh, I've got to say, Fires near me, um, we had huge support from the community. And, and we didn't hear, um, oh, well, it would be great if it did all that. Uh, I'm not saying you haven't had representations, but we've got to look at the millions of people that use these apps compared to some people that suggest it would be better uh, as a national system. And uh, I just don't happen to be one of those. Yep. And if, if I may just follow up from that, I, I, I think to, to pick up on the term holy grail, I, I think realistically the, the holy grail is getting that consistency in data across the country so that people can use that data in a number of ways and whether that is through a product like a, a national app or being used by Google or Facebook or other providers out there and ensuring that that data is fed out in a consistent way and, and helps agencies like the RFS or like EMV amplify its messages and its warnings to the community. I think that is the holy grail that we're working towards, getting that data consistency, providing that to the public and then letting any party, whether it is an app developer or, as I said, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters of, of the world, being able to use that data and publish it and, and help us get our messages and our warnings out to the community. Thanks for that. Um, one last question from me. You've, in your submission and in the discussion today, we've discussed the importance of, of fire tracking, so making sure we have accurate data on the fire front. Um, 
and I might have asked this last time we discussed, Mr Rogers, but again, this is to the whole panel. Is the National Bushfire Intelligence Capability Program that has been announced quite recently, is that looking at the best ways of improving that data capture or um, is that more covered by the sorts of um, RFS standalone activities through acquiring new line scanning capabilities? I think it's probably both, really, because at the end of the day, there is certainly um, a look nationally at trying to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're looking at needs of all states and territories. Um, and, and we indeed do share a lot of platforms during the um, peak fire season. Indeed, a line scanning aircraft has historically been shared between 50-50 uh, between New South Wales and Victoria, uh, as well as dedicated resources. Uh, I guess what we found in New South Wales is that um, we need beyond that. So we'll continue to um, contribute to um, national arrangements, but we'll also um, enhance our own arrangements uh, within the state of New South Wales and indeed make that available because uh, we like to, we, we think that what we're doing is a next generation to line scanning. It's a better quality. So uh, we'll be looking at enhancing that and then sharing that data with other states and territories and indeed sharing platforms, which... We do, we will do with that. We do with large air tankers. Um, we, we, we all share uh, our resources. So I, d I don't think there's any problem with that, but uh, I guess it's just making sure there's sufficient quantities to share. Ms Key, Ms Fitzgerald, is that consistent with your understanding that the National Bushfire Intelligence Capability will be working on improving data capture in that space while Victoria does its own thing as well to add to what the NBIC does? That's right. Um, that is our understanding of, of that uh, piece of work. And um, we understand that the Commonwealth, um, following feedback from states and territories, is undertaking some further work on the sort of scope and nature and deliverables associated with that. Um, so we look, you know, we look forward to you know, understanding that and, um, and working that through with the Commonwealth. If, if I may, if I can just go to the national app, um, and I just want to check that you're still able to hear me OK. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, so in relation to the national app, um, uh, we understand that the um, Australian... Go on again. ..and considered a what a national app may look like. Um, and Victoria is largely supportive can of I just, um, can I jump in there? a national app that obviously improves... We lost you. We've lost you. you yes. We've, we, we lost all that. We've lost you for about a minute there, I suppose, or maybe 30 seconds or so. Um, it was all your best okay. stuff. OK. <laughs> I might try again. Uh, uh, Ms. Ms Fitzgerald, I'm not... I'm My not... recall is being tested today. <laughs> I, will, um, I will start... Ms Fitzgerald, if I can just assist you, I've got the transcript. Uh, the, uh, you were saying that in relation to the National App, we understand that the app obviously improves, and that's when we lost you. And I think if it, it, seems to be, it seems to be particularly problematic when you look down. So if you can just do your best to answer, direct your comments direct to the microphone, we might have a little bit less interference. I don't know why that's the case, but I've noticed a correlation. Whether, whether it's the cause, we'll find out shortly. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as I was saying, we, we would support a national um, a national approach to obviously information reporting, and I think we've talked through some of that work um, already uh, today in relation to it. I think why Victoria has been able to be successful in relation to the Vic Emergency um, app is that it reflects our integrated all emergencies, all agencies approach. Um, to our emergency management system. So it's it's simply a sort of external facing, I suppose, um, aspect of our system. So the system that you have in behind is, is very important. The data that you have available, um, it's, um, you know, it's consistency and comprehensiveness and timeliness is also obviously critical to, uh, um, to a, you know, a functioning app, whether that be state-wise or uh, national. And the other, the other aspect I would say as well is that um, we're also obviously hearing through a lot of our feedback is that there's a desire for more local and um, targeted and tailored information. So I think any 
or app consideration needs to balance what people need on the ground to be able to make decisions as opposed to having a sort of perfect view across the country, essentially. So I think there's there's some sort of critical success factors to what a national approach um, or a national app may look like. Um, and uh, and we understand, as I said, that, that the Australian Data and Digital Council is, is currently considering um, those aspects and, and Victoria is participating in that, in that discussion. Um, yes, I have two reasonably short questions, I hope. Um, first to uh, Victoria, you did speak about the fact that you were piloting some th this cross-border question in the uh, availability of information in the cross-border region. Um, I just wondered whether you're also making that pilot available in New South Wales, or is it just to the Victorian side of the border? Uh, Commissioner, what we're piloting at the moment is the local um, the local pages, um, the local incident pages, um, and so um, we. I might just get Miss Key to talk through what that looks like. So it's not. Um, so that's what we're sort of trialling at the moment, essentially. So, Commissioner, that approach uh, takes data from a range of sources uh, that would include road data electricity and other essential services, as well as information that we would receive across the border and, and places it in a local view or a more targeted, closer view so that we're not cluttering the map in a state view with a whole range of information for those communities. But it's that information that's critical for communities to make decisions uh, based on what they're going to do with. Uh-oh. Lost. We've lost her. They're going to go in. Can you hear us? Uh, we, we lost a bit of the, but I think I got the idea. I, I, I think I understood the gist of what you were saying. My question, though, was when you are doing all this work and making that information available in the local communities, are you, is, is that going to be available across the border for the New South Wales side of the local communities? Uh, yes, definitely. We provide our information up to 50 kilometres across the border. So whether we consume information from uh, the Rural Fire Service or whether New South Wales roads, that information uh, will be provided up to 50 kilometres across the border. So and we obviously also share the information with with RFS to use in the same context. Well, I'm sorry, when you say R, when you give it to our RFS to use in the same context, I'm just thinking from the member of the community's perspective, will a member of the community on the New South Wales side of the border be able to access this integrated information that, Vic, that, that Victoria has prepared and is sending out? Is that the Victoria now? Yes, they will. Yeah. Uh, it would be provided through the Vic Emergency app. And uh, that'd be accessible. Thank you. That's that's that question. Um, I just got in one more question for New South Wales, and it was a clarification one. When we talked about people relying on the app, the question was asked about firefighters on the ground, and um, I think you said, Mr. Rogers, no, they get information, other information as well. But then I thought in another part of the evidence, you were saying that the uh, firefighters on the ground access their information through fires near me. So I've got two questions. <laughs> two aspects to the question. One is, do the firefighters, um, I mean, they obviously access fires near me, but if they have other information, why isn't that other information available on the fires near me app? That's the first part of it. And the second part of it is, isn't there a benefit both for firefighters and the community to have a single source of information and not have to go to one or two different sources? So, a, if, the, if there's information available to firefighters, why isn't it also on fires near me? Secondly, isn't, aren't you working towards having what I would call a single source of truth? I think it all is a single source of truth. It comes from our main system. ICON is our management system. Fires near me takes data from that. Um, but, but firefighters themselves, they can access things through fires near me and obviously I don't know individually what every one of them does but they can also get information from our common operating picture which has sort of more tactical information that's relevant for firefighters it might have an observation um, you know it, it might have particular things to do with weather in that local area there could be a whole host of different things that we use from a firefighting point of view that isn't and if you were to overlay all that on fires near me the page would be very, very cluttered. 
we need to try and keep things quite clean for the community and make sure it's it's clean, it's easy to understand, um, and it's and it's very accessible. So the more data you put out there, the more difficult it is. The more data bandwidth it draws and all of those things. So um, I, I guess it's up to firefighters themselves how they want to access that information, but they can get it through uh, our common operating picture um, or they may choose to use FOSNME. I, mean, I, I can't speak for 70,000 people on what they choose to do. Thank you. Mm. And a couple of questions from me. Uh, can we just put up on the screen what I'm seeing on my top screen, please, That's up there? The, uh, the two apps? The, the photos of the two apps? Yeah. Yep. Just a, a question. It's a question for Victoria, uh, either Miss Key or Miss Fitzgerald, and it goes back to when's too much information, too much information, and it, it becomes too too general. So, I understand uh, the all hazards approach from Victoria, but I would say, looking at the two maps, if I was trying to respond as a member of the community to a bushfire, the fires near me, New South Wales app, gives me a little bit more accuracy on where the fire actually is rather than just a general region uh, on the Victorian one. So for Miss Fitzgerald, is there another level of depth I can go into on that Victorian one to understand exactly where the fire is or is there somewhere else I have to go? Uh, no, that's right. So I think there's there's two key features, I suppose, that um, help with um, uh, the business busyness issue. One is that um, it, uh, the Vic Emergency app allows you to create a watch zone, and that is scalable um, uh, around. And you can create that around your home or your work or, or whatever it may be. And so you can create much more localized notifications um, within your watch zone, and you can have multiple um, watch zones. The other aspect is that. Um, we also provide um, the ability to um, add layers, obviously, to um, the information that you're seeing on the Vic Emergency app as well, um, and or remove those layers as well. So, so there's a lot of um, user control in relation to the information that they see on the Vic Emergency app. It is one of the areas that we continue to improve is usability of the app. Um, in relation to particularly things around um, push notifications and also, um, you know, controlling the notifications that you do receive through the app. So we, um, you know, our, our position is that we provide all relevant information to community that we consider that they need to be able to sort of make decisions, but we also provide them with the control to sort of filter that information in and out within reason. Obviously, we retain control, particularly when it comes to the most upper end of the information and warnings, um, but they have an ability to be able to control the information that they're also seeing. Okay, I appreciate that. And the, I, I understand the, the fires near me one also gives you a chance to put those your positions in and the like, but the question about the your app, does, does it show me where the fire is or just a, a general thing? And it gets back to, with the warning system putting the impetus back on the community and individuals to make decisions, do you have a better fidelity of information for them to do that? Because at the moment, it's a what I'm seeing is just a general view. Is there a, a layer I can go into that shows me a high level of fidelity to make a timely decision if that's what a national warning system is going to get the community to do? Uh, yes, Commissioner, as you uh, would experience uh, with your experience with the fires near me app, ours is quite similar. We can zoom right in down to house and street level where you can see where the fire is. You can see those black areas that represent similarly uh, on the fires near me app on Vic Emergency that represent the current burnt area of the fire. On our app, uh, we do represent the fire icon that you can see there, active fires in black, and the warnings icons themselves are issued for communities. So that is a, a significant difference, um, and, I, and as we understand where some of the frustration occurs, where Victoria, as an outcome of the Bushfires Royal Commission in 2009, we represent our warnings specifically for communities and based on where what risk, as Mr Rogers was discussing, what the risk is for those communities, rather than where the Fire CME app and the uh, New South Wales Rural Fire Service approach is that the warning attaches to the fire itself, and there is one warning uh, pertaining to and one warning level pertaining to each fire, and you can see that represented there on the Fire CME app. No, and I appreciate that. Now I can see the darker 
patches underneath all the other icons where the, the, the scar, burn scar is. I appreciate that. So I've got a couple more questions for, for New South Wales, just uh, noting other bits of information that were developed uh, over the, the fire season. One, I think, was called the Red Zones, where you're looking at predictions. And I can't remember. I know it was on your web page. Was that available on the app uh, at, at all, the predictions? So while it wasn't uh, available as an overlay on the map, it was available as a link that you tap yeah. on and, and open up that map. Absolutely. No, pre thank that, you for that. that. Is something yeah. that sorry, that, so that is something that from a predictive sense we're looking at how we incorporate those things for the next day, uh, you know, which is what those red zones did, um, in particular in the south coast uh, that we used for quite a few days. So uh, that is something as part of our development of the app that where we're, we're looking at those predictive tools of how we incorporate that. Again, it's, it's uh, I think, as uh, Ms Key said, about trying to make sure that you have the right level of data. You're not over-cluttering a map so that all you see is a mass of icons and symbology because I, I just think people will... Um, become quite confused with that. So we've got to try and get the good information to people to make them, you know, give them enough information to be informed, but not over overload yeah. them. And I, and I don't think we, we're, we're all looking for that right level, I think. I, I, I would also offer that on those um, red maps, as, as they've been termed, um, feedback that we did get from the community was that um, they were a very useful tool in communicating the risk across the broad landscape. But one of the um, the interesting and consistent bits of feedback that we got was that people wanted it to be very granular and to be able to actually zoom into a street level to work out mm. if you're in the red area or if you're not. Now, those maps are predictions. They're not that they accurate. They aren't no. designed to be that. dots. So that, that's some of the feedback we've got from the community and one of the considerations that we're working with. Yeah, OK. And I've got two more questions. I'm going to zoom out of the app for the for the first one. I understand, Commissioner Rogers, uh, was it the term tourist leave zones were, were declared, uh, I think, for the first time. Uh, how are they notified to, to the public in an information sense? Well, we, we again. It was uh, it was maps that were prepared. We just had a, a large hatched area, and our our message was simple: if you're a tourist and you're in that hatched area, leave. And then we uh, and and I've got to say, it was very very successful. Uh, we had a pretty comprehensive plan involving uh, New South Wales Transport, New South Wales Police. Um, you know, because we had a lot of people evacuating through active fire zones. Um, and that, that involved a lot of coordination and obviously ready to uh, cut uh, roads so people were caught on pitch points. But basically, we identified the area, publicised it and basically told people to go home. And, uh, and I've got to say, very, very successful. And uh, I'm extremely grateful we did that, to be honest. No, and I appreciate that. And the, and the, the next question, is there an authority around that or is it really just a, uh, a, a warning or a, a, a uh, information it comes across as being that there's an authority to enact that for the police or RFS or whatever. Is that the case or is it more a uh, an, an information thing for the community? Look, there was a, a state of emergency in play at that point. So uh, I, I guess it, 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 could, it wasn't issued as an order, mm. but it was very much of if you're in this area, leave the area and local... Uh, local government, um, you know, uh, businesses, everybody was getting involved in that. And I think because of the number of fatalities we've already had and uh, the fires from border to border, people were very attuned to the risk um, and, uh, and therefore people very readily accepted that. That us saying go was they just took it. Uh, so whether we officially you know, put it in an evacuation order uh, or just simply were articulated what, what we wanted people to do. People certainly acted on it and uh, and we had thousands of people leaving the next morning. OK, and, I, and from a commission view, we'll look a bit more about that uh, in uh, later later sessions. One final question, Mr Rogers, and it, and it's, and it, and it relates to an all-hazards warning approach. Uh, obviously, your RFS... In New South Wales, if there was an all-hazards approach to this, would the RFS pick up, and this is an opinion, sorry, but would the RFS pick up the role of, of 
providing that information or is there a, a higher level or a, another group that would pick up that all hazards approach to be able to warn the, the community or has New South Wales not had a chance to, to think about the actual implementation of it yet? Uh, no, no, I don't think it has. But I mean, whether, um, you know, based on a decision of government, um, they chose to say, you know, the fires near me becomes an all hazards. I mean, that's obviously a decision of government. And uh, I mean, I think that the app is capable of doing that. Um, again, we just have to make sure that it's um, it's got consistent data. Um, and, you know, it, it's one of those things where we'll, we'll obviously react to whatever decision the government makes in regards to that. I, I think our app can do it. Um, our app has got uh, a huge amount of credibility with the public, and I think that's where, um, you know, you want to leverage off that and, uh, and enhance that. And, uh, and we've already got some, obviously, some quite ambitious development work ahead of us. Now, uh, obviously, if that includes making that an all hazards uh, uh, application, then uh, then obviously that's what we'd do. Okay, thank could you. I, could I also... Yes, Mr. Uh, a, a, a quick, um, David, on, on the national app discussion as well. I, I, I think two points. Um, firstly, I, I think we need to recognise that there has been a national all-hazard app in the past, which was developed by the Commonwealth using data from agencies across the country, so a disaster app. Um, developed several years ago. I don't believe that app is still in existence. Um, so that was discontinued a, a number of years ago. Um, and we also manage and, and build a national fire app called Fires Near Me Australia, which ingests feeds from all states and territories across the country. But I think a, a cursory glance at that app will highlight the, the issue that we spoke about earlier about the need for consistency in data and consistency in, in icons as well. And that's just within the fire space. No, thanks for that. I'm aware of that app and I understand the issues that you uh, you raised with it. Uh, yep. For Mr Rogers, Mr Clark, Ms Key, Ms Fitzgerald, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We appreciate we've gone well over time and Council is looking at me on that, but it was worthwhile, I think, being able to get the bottom of some of the, the issues. And you, and you appreciate some of the concerns that have come out of submissions to the Commission. Mr Clark, I would point you to the 1,700 submissions that we've got. If you delve in there, I think you'll find some feedback uh, that's consistent without having to, to run community forums. I'll give you some themes to go down. Uh, to have a look at what the, the concerns were. And Ms Fitzgerald, similar similar thing. They might, might be with New South Wales. There were some with Victoria, but worth <coughs> getting in there and seeing what some of the, the on-ground community issues for those that were in the fires and affected by them, what they are, what they felt, and what they've provided to the to the Commission. Thank you to the four of you. appreciate it. Ms Ogundoran. Might they be released from their summonses? They may be released from these summons. Thank you very much. Uh, now... Chair, Commissioners, we are approaching 40 minutes behind time. Uh, the proposal I have is that we could have Mr Fish, who I understand is on uh, on standby, mm -hmm. uh, a, um, but there is a separate panel of three witnesses from different organisations uh, who are timetabled for 11.45. We, might, we could make some inquiries to see if Mr Fisher could come back um, at another point, perhaps when we hear from Bush, Bushfires IO. I know it's very um, inconvenient to hear. Yeah, can we apologise to Mr Fisher? Waiting. And can we apologise to Mr Fisher and ask him for that, please? I appreciate uh, time is precious for everyone that's, uh, that's working with the Commission. Um, but I think it would be easier, rather than try and link up three others across the country uh, again. I think it'd be easier if we could just ask Mr Fisher to delay and we'll organise another time for him today. All right, we'll have that communicated. Um, yes, there will need to be a, sh a little bit of time uh, in order to set up that panel to bring it through to the hearing room. So, uh, and they are also awaiting in the yeah. electronic hearing, waiting room. Okay, right. so let's take a, a short adjournment for 10 minutes and we'll uh, reconvene at 11.50 by which time we'll have them on. We've apologised to Mr Fisher and we'll look for a time to be able to bring him on today. Thank you. Thank you. All rise.
The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr Tokely. Welcome. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, Commissioners, before we begin the first panel, um, our first panel on the roads, there are a couple of housekeeping matters, if I may attend to those. Uh, first is I wish to attend to some documents from hearing bundles one and two, and the first is in relation to aerial firefighting, and there are bundles 4.2, 4.5, 4.6 and 4.7, those could be received. The second is in relation to documents relevant to the various topics addressed in hearing bundle number one, by hearing block number one, that's bundle number 6.7, and then there was the um, document relevant to hazard reduction in bundle number 9.4. Okay. Supplementary tender list has been provided. Okay, we've got those and we'll take those exhibits as marked. Thank you Thank very you. much. And then for today's hearing, I wish to tender documents 14.6 to 14.16 on the tender list, which has been made available to the parties with a leave to appear. We'll take those as tendered as well. Thank you very much. Commissioners, I intend to do a very brief opening, as you've heard an opening yesterday from Ms Hogan Doran, and this is just to set some of the scene matters for uh, the panel that's to come and the panel that we'll be dealing with this afternoon. So the focus of the hearing will now turn to roads. Uh, commissioners, you heard in Ms Hogan Doran's opening yesterday that submissions to the Commission raised re various issues in relation to roads, including confusion about road closures, the impact of road closures on evacuation and the vulnerability of communities where there is one road in and one road out. As was anticipated by Ms Hogan Doran, today you will hear evidence from the trucking and transport associations in relation to the difficulties they experienced during the 2019-2020 bushfires. You'll also hear evidence from the various state and territory government agencies responsible for roads and transport. The impact of the 2019-2020 bushfires on Australia's roads and transportation network was significant. Before I turn to the witnesses, I'll briefly summarise some of the evidence received in relation to the impact. In terms of road closures, there were a significant number of New South Wales state roads were impacted by bushfires, with closure durations ranging from several hours to, in one case, a number of months. Key routes impacted included the Pacific Highway, the Bruxner Highway, the Princes Highway, and the Hume Highway. The severity of the fires often resulted in simultaneous closure of key north-south and east-west routes, impacting the ability of the community members to evacuate, as well as transport essential goods and freight. The state of Victoria experienced interruption in the form of road closure and increased risk of use to 27 arterial roads in the northeast and east Gippsland regions. Approximately 1,680 kilometres of Victorian roads were affected. In Queensland, 52 state-controlled roads were closed at various stages due to the bushfire impacts of the 2019-2020 bushfire season. The total hours of road closures was 10,598, and the average duration of road closures was 8.4 days. Between South Australia and Western Australia, there were significant closures of the Air Highway, which provides the only sealed link along the southern end of Western Australia to South Australia, which restricted freight and public movement. In South Australia, other road closures included the Playford Highway on Kangaroo Island and six state road closures in the Adelaide Hills. Altogether, there were 51 days of road closure in Western Australia, and three major highways in and out of the Australian Capital Territory were closed at various points in time during the 2019-2020 bushfires. As far as costs were concerned, there was an estimated $77 million worth of damage to New South Wales state infrastructure on the transport network. An additional $14 million worth of costs were associated with preparing roads for reopening in New South Wales. The estimated cost of the Victorian Department of Transport for response and asset restoration was approximately $23 million with an additional 13 million in increased maintenance costs over the next one to five years. This does not include the costs associated with municipal council roads. The approximate expenditure on emergency works in Queensland is currently estimated at $4.712 million, and the estimated cost of clearance, reopening and road repair of roads to the South Australian Department of Planning, Transport and Infrastructure 
was $683,000. And in the ACT, the cost of traffic management and road clearing was approximately $325,000. Neither of those costs include the cost to local government in relation to local roads. Uh, Chair, Commissioners, will now go to the first of our panels, which is concerned with the um, commercial road industry. And there are three witnesses that I'll be calling. The first is Mr. Samuel Marks, Transport and Infrastructure Advisor, the Australian Trucking Association. Mr. Stephen Blake Shearer, the Executive Director, South Australian Road and Transport Association. And Mr. Campbell John Doomey, the CEO of the Western Roads Federation. Gentlemen, good morning still in all of Australia. So thank you for joining us. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Marks, I understand that you will take the oath? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Mr. Marks, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Mr. Shearer, I understand you'll take the affirmation. Mm. Yes. Mr. Shearer, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. And Mr. Dume, I understand you'll take the oath as well? Yes. Mr. Dume, mm. do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Gentlemen, I'd just like to ask you some introductory questions around your role and responsibilities. If I could please start with you, Mr. Marks, if you could explain your role and the, ro the role of your association. Mm. Yes, certainly. Um, so my name is Samuel Marks. I'm the Transport and Infrastructure <laughs> Advisor at the Australian Trucking Association. Uh, the ATA is the peak national industry organisation representing the trucking industry. Its members include other state and sector-based associations. It includes corporates and associate members. And through its Industry Technical Council, uh, membership also includes businesses with leading expertise in engineering and technology. In my role in, with the ATA, I provide advice and develop policy on transport and infrastructure policy and related issues. I provide support to the ATA General Council, which represents our, our members and through that the industry and its policy committees. It also supports the association's work with in regards to government relations. And this, so for example, has included representing the ATA on the National Peak Bodies Bushfire Recovery Coordination Forum and the Agriculture Minister's Roundtable on with the bushfires back in January. Thank you, Mr. Marks. And Mr. Shearer, if I could ask you about your role and that of your association. Mm. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, I've been the executive director of the South Australian Road Transport Association for 26 years. Uh, SATA is the peak industry body in South Australia um, that has membership of approximately 300 covering all sectors of the industry from all parts of the state at all sizes of fleets from people with one truck up to large fleets with a thousand trucks. Uh, we have a board of 14 um, operators who manage uh, and direct the association. My role is to advise them and all of our members um, and implement decisions made by the board on everything from operational matters such as the current issues with cross-border um, uh, uh, travel arrangements under the COVID uh, current crisis, access for heavy vehicles throughout the state, um, law enforcement issues, liaison with the police department and uh, DIPT and the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator, media liaison, industrial relations, and, and basically um, uh, I'm the go-to guy within South Australia for most truck operators for almost any problem that they have which means I have the pleasure of receiving emails and phone calls, as do all of my colleagues, uh, when a crisis occurs you know, throughout the day, 24-7, and they rely very heavily on us. So it's a very central role within the industry in South Australia. Thank you, Mr Sherr. And Mr Campbell, can I clarify how to pronounce your surname, please? 
Uh, it's pronounced Dumasy. We came a credible second in the French Revolution. It's lost <laughs> <as well. laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dumasy. Could I ask you to outline your role and that of your your federation, please? Mm. So we, we hold a similar role to Steve, but for Western Australia, um, within our role, we basically, our membership is most of the uh, family-owned and corporate companies, transport companies within the state. Well, we provide direct advice to the Minister of um, the Heavy Vehicle Minister, uh, the Ministerial Panel. Uh, I sit on the State Freight and Logistics Council, also uh, part of the uh, an ad hoc group, which is a supply chain emergency response group for DFES. Uh, provide a number of advice points within training uh, operations and alike both to government and to industry. Uh, we sit on the remote area consultative group on areas of covering which advises through then to the Transport and Infrastructure Council of Government. Um, so we sit within a number of those things. We also cover industrial relations. But in essence, as, as a peak transport body for the state, we are the go-to uh, providing bi-directional flow of information between the state and uh, the government and industry. And in times of emergency, we tend to be the response group that the industry contacts first in order to get information. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to ask you some questions, gentlemen, around um, road closures during the last bushfire season and the information that's been received. But could, but could I start, first of all, um, with Mr Shearer and Mr Shearer if you could just give a brief outline of the impact of road closures on the trucking industry within South Australia and to your knowledge elsewhere. Mm. Yes certainly uh, Council. Mm. The, um, on the road from uh, the air highway which essentially picks up all the traffic from Adelaide to Perth but also heavy vehicle traffic from Sydney to Perth and Melbourne to Perth um, it, it is the single corridor. It is one road, not two. It doesn't become a different road at the border. Um, that road, but the latest figures that I've managed to get from uh, Dipti um, is that road has about 1,500 heavy vehicles a week um, in one direction. Um, uh, other routes that we have in South Australia that are very significant coming in from Victoria uh, we have around about 2,000 uh, trucks a week uh, coming in, um, bringing freight to South Australia or taking freight back, um, and similar numbers between Adelaide and Sydney. Coming down through the Adelaide Hills on the South East Freeway, the annual figure puts it into context. 660,000 trucks a year come down the freeway. Uh, about a third of those are local trucks, not interstate. But it shows you... The, the scale of it and I've long drawn on my background as a biologist in explaining the role that we play to people in government and the community. Um, the heavy vehicle industry along with other modes of transport but the heavy vehicle industry is really like the cardiovascular system of the economy and the community. We bring in everything that's needed, uh, move it around the organisation called Australia and we take out um, what's not needed and the refuse. And if the uh, trucking industry um, stalls, it's very similar to a blockage in an artery or a vein in the human body. It can very quickly have consequences for the body or the community and the economy, but it can also have very severe consequences for the trucking industry because um, we have about 40,000 businesses in the industry they operate roughly on a 2 to 3% profit margin. It's extremely tight. It takes very little impact in terms of lost opportunity, um, which is what happens when trucks are stopped due to road closures. It takes very little impact to wipe out um, all lift, or at least the bulk, but easily all of the profit margin from those vehicles for that year. So when we have road closures on the air highway, for understandable reasons such as bushfires um, and trucks are stuck for two weeks, that's the profit margin gone on those vehicles for the year. Um, and because we are very heavily regulated, as a truck driver, an individual can only work legally and safely for so many hours in a week and in a fortnight, and they can only travel at legal speed. So it is very difficult to make up for that lost revenue. Uh, the best estimates that we have at the moment 
is that the impact on the operators on the Adelaide Perth route on the air highway was of the order of four or five million dollars a week um, and that's money gone uh, which they can't recover but the greatest impact was really the stress created for all those involved, be it the drivers and the owners and managers. And remembering that 75% of the industry and thus a lot of the vehicles on the air highway, heavy vehicles, are small to medium businesses run by uh, mums and dads who own and operate the business. They have enormous stress placed on them when incidents like this occur, worrying about their drivers on the road, um, try to find out what's happening with the fires, making decisions or needing to make decisions. Do I let my trucks go and leave the depot or should I be holding them here or holding them at Port Augusta or somewhere else? So the, the inability to get reliable, timely information is not only bad for business, but it creates enormous stress and, in our view, um, raises serious potential safety risks for all those involved. Do, well, I've got you, Mr Shearer, on the question of information. What information is available to the trucking industry, to your association, around road closures, first of all, within the state, and then secondly, outside of the state? Mm. The, the key difficulty is knowing where to go to find the information. Um, and I've got to say, Western Australia did a better job of that than South Australia, in my view. I was able once I came across it, and um, uh, Mr Dumasey and I and our colleagues, we've got a good network ourselves, and we relied fairly heavily on exchanging information once each one of us had found it within our jurisdiction. The availability of information within South Australia was actually fairly poor. Um, it was spasmodic. Uh, and the difficulty is that it sets up a conflict between the official information when it's released um, as against the industry intel that is coming back from drivers in their trucks and uh, they talk a lot on their CB radio. And quite often a lot of that is misinformation because they're going on the bit they can see right in front of them as distinct from the whole picture. Uh, they may not know what's occurring properly and effectively down the road. So I found myself reaching out to the government and people in government to get information because they weren't reaching out to us. There was almost no engagement by government with industry other than the engagement that we initiated, or at least in South Australia. And that created a serious problem. Can I, can I just stop you there for a second, Mr Shearer? With, with respect to the information that's being received by a truck driver, one of your, your association members, first of all, is there information available within South Australia about the presence of bushfires? And secondly, does that information stop at the border or does it continue past the border? Hmm. The South Australian information stops at the border. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not information that is readily found by most people in the industry. They don't know where to look. Um, there are bushfire alert systems on radio um, which you can pick up, um, but that's, that doesn't give you the full picture. Um, but there is some information available. But fundamentally, what operators need and drivers need is not just to know that that road's closed, um, with a fairly short notice, but preferably some indication within the constraints of managing the crisis about when it, it's anticipated subject to weather and other changes it's likely to open so that they can plan because a truck coming from Brisbane or Sydney has got um, two days to a day before it gets to a point that it might need to consider in South Australia that it needs to stop at Port Augusta. Um, the lack of that information in a timely fashion and readily available and remembering uh, all of the associations, although we'd like to claim more, most of us have 20% of the industry uh, as members. Uh, so there are a lot of operators and a lot of drivers who are not a member of anything. Um, and that's their choice, but it means 
they are utterly reliant on our social media output and on whatever else they can find and on what they hear on the rumour mill on the truck radio CB network, which is probably the least reliable quite often. Mr so Chair, the, while I've got the, you there, I, just, uh, I should have said borders plural because South Australia borders Victoria, New yes. South Wales, the Northern Territory and Western Australia. So do I understand from what you're saying that the, the information stops at the borders of all the three states and the one territory? In our case, it does. Uh, I had to rely on information from interstate rather than through a single source. In, in an ideal world, we would have a single source of truth that we would all be able to go to uh, that would need to be some form of nationally coordinated source of information and updated. Years ago in my public order and police affairs role, um, Australia confronted the challenge through law enforcement agencies as of, of establishing a uh, national fingerprint database. That, that all police agencies agreed to do it, but none of them wanted to release their information to the others. And we have similar problems within the road transport industry in information passing from uh, the agencies in, say, New South Wales or Victoria, Victoria to agencies in South Australia. I might get a truck defect cleared in Victoria, but they don't make any substantial effort to inform the authorities in South Australia. And we have would have the same problem with national coordination unless there is a firm commitment and real engagement by the governments in each jurisdiction to make that a high priority rather than an afterthought to have a single nas national source of truth. Thank you very much, Mr Shearer. Might now go to Western Australia, Mr Dumsey. If you could, you've heard what Mr Shearer has had to say. Did your federation, its members, encounter similar problems with respect to information within Western Australia and in relation to your border with South Australia and the Northern Territory? Hmm. Yeah, Mr Shearer uh, pretty much sort of summarised the, the, what the reality is. The fact is that in order to gain information, you essentially um, you, you set up your own intelligence network for want of a better description, uh, and it is essentially an informal network. So you're either contacting drivers directly at rest areas or other points once you can you know, establish contact through the companies to find out who else is there. Uh, you set up informal networks, you know, with uh, based on relationships with different government agencies. Uh, in order to try and get a picture of what's going on, essentially the focus is on on the firefight, on the on the fire ground. That's where both the media focus is and also the operational focus of the agencies. Uh, as, from our perspective, the broader con you know, the broader issues that we face uh, beyond the fire grounds uh, are not well communicated. I'll pick up on Mr Shearer's point, you know, we'll pull, for example, uh, one of our companies will pull um, produce out of far north Queensland, but I think it's Cairns, Tully area. Uh, they run 10 road trains a week on a cycle through to Perth, it's about three days or thereabouts down to the South Australian border uh, to where the fire ground was, um, and then they're held up. You know, we got to get back earlier up in the in the supply chain to stop those things uh, from progressing. We need to know how long the fire ground is is going to be closed, because that produce, which can be worth you know an, a, a substantive amount of money, will otherwise sit at the fire ground and waste out and rot out. So we do rely on informal networks to gather that information in order to disseminate it back across Australia, and that's what the uh, transport agency associations have been doing effectively on behalf of government. Thank you, Mr. Dumsey. The other, sorry. The other issue I'd bring to, to attention, Council, is that from a West Australian perspective, in regards to the air highway fires, given the tragedies that are unfolding in the southeast corner of Australia, the media attention nationally and within the state focused on those fires. Though the air highway fire was very poorly reported, and we were singularly relied on the. Uh, agencies like Kalgoorlie Minor and ABC Goldfields in order to provide media-based information. Thank, thank you. Mr Dumsey, I might just bring up a map which is included it, it, with your statement. It's document number WRF.500.001.0002.
and uh, can you, s it's the, if you could. I can uh, see that, yes. Yes, if you could expand upon that. Now, I, um, if you could just give me a brief description of what this is um, and then explain some of the coloured lines on there, please. Mm. Apart from the fact that tributes to the fact that a master's in pure maths, not in uh, graphic design, <laughs> the the map the map indicates what happened on the fifth to the seventh of January, and there, as I pick up on Mr. Shearer's point, there is only one sealed road across the bottom of Australia, and we have one sealed road across the top out via Cunanara onto the Victoria Highway into New South Wales. We had three simultaneous natural events occur. We had tropical cyclone Blake. Uh, a warning was issued, uh, as per that graphic, which closed the Great Northern Highway between Port Hedland and Broome. It's a 600 kilometre length of road, but it's our only road out to the north via sealed road. Simultaneously, we had the Great Central Road, which is shown there in blue, which is an unsealed road, which we use as a freight route, which connects us from Laverton, New South Wales, through to Alice Springs via Docker River. We pull a lot of fuel down from Darwin. We pull other produce from Darwin and an area, vice versa, through that route. That was closed due to flooding from a previous event uh, that had passed through the interior, and so the road hence was closed. Finally, in the bottom corner there, you can see the bottom. You see the uh, air highway and uh, the road closures there, which were basically around Norseman, where the junction of the air highway um, meets the. Uh, the north-south highway there between uh, Kalgoorlie and Esperance. So those three routes, which are the only roads, uh, roads out of uh, Western Australia, were all simultaneously closed. So the Western Australia uh, itself was totally isolated due to natural events from the rest of the country. And is it the case with the um, Western Australian information, similar to South Australia, that it ends at the borders? Uh, yes, it does. Yes. And um, I'll just come to Mr. Marks briefly, and then I'll come back to you, Mr. Dumsey. Uh, Mr. Marks, did you wish to add anything to what Mr. Shearer has said or Mr. Dumsey said? Um, well, yes, I would certainly agree with what they've both had to say. Um, the other, like, just to add some East Coast perspective, I guess, it's also worth reflecting uh, on some of the closures, in particular in New South Wales. So the closure of the Hume Highway, which has been estimated to carry about 40% of the national road freight task. So that's quite a big impact when it closes, and it closed on multiple occasions. Uh, and when it came to the northern parts of New South Wales, there was a stage there where the five main routes from the New England inland area and the coast all closed at once, which some operators reported led to a basically a 600-kilometre diversion, which ended up meaning that the, fulfilling those contracts ended up costing them more than, than they made. Um, and we've certainly also heard sort of from operators, uh, going back to some of Cam and Steve's comments about uh, you know, having to source the road closure information from different different spots for different jurisdictions, sort of added to the, the workload and the, the general feeling of confusion at the time. Uh, in saying that, though, we did also hear that for some of the New South Wales in particular, for some of the specific information sources, once you found them, like the New South Wales RFS map or the live traffic information or the proactive outreach from New South Wales police, some of that information was quite good. Um, so it's worth reflecting, worth saying that. Just it was, if you operate across borders, getting the information for all the different jurisdictions was quite a, quite a task. Thank you very much, Mr. Marks. Back to you, Mr. Dumsey. I noticed on the, the, the map that you've got up there that it suggests that in order to ascertain some information around the roads and their closures, you might have to go to different websites. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So Main Roads over here provides a, a very good interactive updated map of, of all road closures. However, you also need to go to the Bureau of Meteorology um, if it's cyclonic, if we divert, if we just uh, move to the cyclones for a second. The, you've got to basically go to the Bureau of Meteorology for cyclone warnings because that won't be covered on the roads because it's an impending alert. The problem with cyclones is that once they cross the coast, often that and they're downgraded, which we've had before, those alerts are removed from Bureau of Meteorology and therefore you actually rely on other sources. 
So you do need to actually check a number of sources in order to, um, to find out information. It's worth pointing out, and I'll stick to the Perth to Adelaide route, that distance is the same distance roughly as it is from Paris to Moscow. Hmm. And there isn't a lot in between. There's some small towns and roadhouses once you're on the air highway about every 100 odd kilometres. Um, so companies do need to plan those routes. Uh, they do need to know uh, and manage their drivers accordingly. And it gets worse, obviously, when you start moving to the more remote areas once you get, say, north of uh, heading towards the Great Central Track or road or you're heading north of Port Hedland. The, the route planning by transport companies is far more detailed and they need to be aware of what's going on because they may need to hold the, cu the trucks back if there's going to be a weather event within a couple of days because it will impact the transport along that route. Thank you very much, Mr Noting, Sorry. Noting that a road train once on... One, noting that a road train, once it's on, on, on road, there are very, very few facilities in remote and regional Australia for a road train to turn around. They're heading in one direction, that's it. So there's not a lot of opportunity to bring them back. Thank, thank you, Mr Dumsey. Mr Shearer, I noticed you put your hand up. Was there something you wished to add to Mr Dumsey's...? Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I think I've just demonstrated um, Mr Dumsey and I have ESP because that's precisely the point I was going to add. Mm. It, it, it's why we need to be able to stop trucks before they get to the point of not being able to turn around. Uh, and it's not as simple um, to the uninitiated. People might think, well, can't you just pull them over to the side of the road? Um, we're talking about double road trains and things called B triples, you know, three trailers. Um, you can't just pull them off onto the soft verge. Often there's too big a, a, a drop off or the verge is soft and they will just sink and roll over. Um, so it is very important to be able to stop those trucks at a place like Port Augusta where they can find some space and some hard pan and perhaps facilities for drivers to be able to rest and eat properly um, because there are very few spots. When you consider the numbers I, I gave you before about the number of trucks a week, if the trucks are all flowing through in the ordinary rate, then the limited number of spaces we have for trucks to pull over and rest and stop is barely adequate. But if, if you um, get a backlog of trucks, you very quickly get to the point where there is no space for the trucks to safely pull up. Uh, and that's a real concern for us in terms of looking after the safety of the drivers. Thank you very much, Mr Shearer. Mr Dumsey, just going back to you, um, during the last bushfire season, does the um, Federation or uh, receive information from the emergency um, management uh, agencies in Western Australia about bushfires, or do they have a person embedded in one of the emergency management organisations? Uh, no, we don't. Um, so in, in second part of your question, no, we do not have anyone embedded within the emergency services organisations. We have suggested that is what is required. In regards to the first part of your question, we obtain information via informal relationships within the respective emergency services groups uh, and similarly within the main roads as well. And what actually ends up happening is that you end up with three-way conversations literally by mobile between individuals um, and it's on the individual relationships that you're obtaining information rather than any structural flow. So I take there's no formal arrangement existing between the WRF and the emergency management authorities in Western Australia? Mm. No, no there's not um, and you know, whilst we're obviously focused on bushfires which is a routine occurrence for us, particularly in with cyclones and wet seasons flooding, particularly up in the northwest. So there is actually no embedded structural um, flow of information and engagement with the uh, with the federation. Uh, we have, in the um, which was at our suggestion uh, at the commencement of the COVID, we did put forward for a multimodal group that, uh, through a learning experience, has now become more embedded in within government but it's still not formally recognised for that flow uh, and, and advice that it's required both to disseminate information to industry and also provide an upflow, a uh, bidirectional flow back 
to government of what is happening on the ground. Thank you. And, and Mr Shearer, as regards SARTA, is there any formal arrangement or um, with the emergency management authorities in South Australia, or is there anyone embedded in the emergency management teams? Mm. Uh, no, there isn't, and in our view, there should be. In the past, going back 15 years, or a little more, probably 18 years, um, when a bushfire um, of a decent size broke out, we would get a telephone call from the emergency control centre, uh, or whatever they were called at the time, and either our president or I would go in and sit there and quite often spend much of our time twiddling our thumbs but constantly listening to what's going on and then putting a hand up saying, well, hang on, there's a transport issue there. Or when they were looking for help, a classic example would be they needed to bring in water tankers. Um, but understandably, the um, officers involved really didn't know much about water tankers uh, who had them, where they were and, and what they were able to do. And we were able to arrange that and provide advice about uh, what was needed to provide that necessary firefighting capacity. Um, there was no engagement at all in the 2019-20 um, uh, crisis. And the only dialogue we had was when I managed to get hold of very senior officers within DIPT to ask a few questions. I actually offered our help and I was I was stunned at the response where they were surprised that we would be able to help. I, I would have thought and do think it should have been an automatic thing uh, because it's pretty clear that transport issues are likely to come up and not only is that important for the trucking industry and the economy we serve, but often we can also play a role in the response process. Um, but that doesn't happen if people don't get involved. And a, a general comment um, from my experience, and I don't say this in relation to all aspects of the crisis management this time round, but in terms of engagement with organisations such as the trucking industry, it indicated to me, and the comments I had made to me when I inquired, it indicated to me that there's been some falling off in the crisis management system and preparedness, um, because in my background I have, a, have some experience in that area, um, and people in key positions, including ministers, used to be rehearsed and trained, and standing operating procedures would be enacted, and one of those might well be um, somebody is designated to contact the trucking industry peak body and ask them to come in and assist. In the absence of that structure, it's not surprising that well-intentioned, hard-working people under stress might not think of the value of that sort of thing. Thank you, Mr Shearer. Mr. Shearer I might just bring up a document, please. It's RTA 500.001.0006. And Mr Shearer, you'll recognise, I just have a highlight on paragraph 50. And if you just take a moment to read that, Mr Shearer. Mm. Yes, thank you. And in your view, would it be possible to have um, to have a single source of truth in terms of uh, information, which, if it was contributed by all of the states, so that there was a way for the Trucking Association and its members to um, be informed of uh, road closures? Uh, from Queensland, for example, all the way through to Western Australia? Mm. I have no doubt at all that it's both possible and practical. The, it, its um, value and success would depend entirely upon the commitment of the jurisdictions and their agencies to uh, working with that. But I would think that any serious discussion about uh, developing such an approach uh, should point out to all of them that it's actually to their own advantage as jurisdictions and agencies uh, because 
surely the authorities in WA or South Australia or elsewhere don't want additional uh, volumes of trucks appearing and knocking on the door when all it does is exacerbate the problem. So it actually assists them in managing um, not only the fire but the environment um, around the fire, um, the operational environment. So I, I would think that if there's a commitment from the jurisdictions and that they recognise the value for themselves as well as for us and the community, uh, I think it's eminently and fairly readily achievable. Thank you, Mr Chair. And could, could the information contained therein be provided to the truck drivers? How would that be done? Mm. Well, as an example, uh, there are multiple avenues and I've always said to people in government, you, you should use the avenues available to you. Uh, for example, on some issues, everybody has to register their truck. There's an avenue to reach out to every truck operator once a year. But there are networks such as the truck stops around the country where we stop and eat and fuel up. Linkages could be established with that truck stop network with the major fuel suppliers. Then you've got the industry associations who will all happily um, use their social media to um, provide this information and provide linkages to the single national source. And then finally, uh, most jurisdictions, we have one here in South Australia, an arrangement where you can get onto an email alert list for any um, road incidents, road crashes and the like. Uh, and you get an email within minutes of uh, that event occurring. Um, so people can opt in to such a system without any difficulty. I think if it's well publicised and we take advantage of, in the case of um, the uh, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, ACT and Tasmania, um, and even a lot of people in WA and NT go to the site of the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator for all sorts of information. So there is another avenue which is of interest to probably 90% of the operators in the country. So there are a number of ways that the single source could be accessed. The key would be to establish the process and platform for that single source. Um, without much difficulty, we will then get people aware of that single source. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Shearer. Mr Dumsey, would you like to comment upon what Mr Shearer said? But, and could I also ask you to take this into account in your answer? I understand there are things called telematically controlled trucks. Would that assist with the yeah. provision of information? As Mr Shearer said, so basically telematics are basically the monitoring systems um, for for, the, for transport. They're used by a number of mid to large fleets. Uh, effectively, it's GPS tracking of trucks for, for, for simplicity of description. So with an example, with uh, the air highway fires, um, one of the agencies was using trying to use Facebook to identify where trucks were located along the air highway. Bear in mind for purposes of just, you know, visualising what this is, problem is, where the trucks were stopped at Kaiguna, um, it's something like 700 kilometres then through back to Seduna. So if you'd imagine over 700 kilometres, there's trucks stopped at the, at, uh, you know, Cocklebitty, uh, some of the road houses. Some trucks have pulled up at rest areas along the route. So you've got people spread over several hundred kilometres, but with no, well, no certainty as to where they were. So they were using Facebook. When we were contacted, we said we could actually use the telematic systems within trucks to identify from our major companies where those where their trucks were located. We could then contact the drivers by mobile phone. The drivers could then actually visually check the other trucks that were in that rest area or parking bay and report back. So I pick up Mr Shearer's point. We can actually create a multi-channel system uh, for distributing, identifying where vehicles are and distributing information. Telematics are becoming increasingly more common. Uh, we can build that in. We have done a pilot within Perth, uh, which we initiated, and that's working with, uh, we work with the university collaborative of the three WA universities to extract data from all the trucks um, and able then to identify where they were. 
So we may be able to move further in to be able to creating a single source of the truth by enabling the government to tap in when required and authorised to, to identify um, as required using whatever system, uh, proprietary systems in place where all trucks are, are currently en route along a particular highway or section of road. So there is a possibility to begin to build the system, but it does need to be multi-channel in its communication. Thank you, Mr Dumsey. And Mr Marks, do you wish to add anything to what Mr Shearer and Mr Dumsey have said? Um, I mean, just to add, I guess, broad agreements, um, particularly Steve's comments about if you were to have a you know, national source of truth, like the, the jurisdictions would have to, I guess, work with it positively. Um, but the main issue I would see is you would not want a situation where there was a significant lag between you know, a road being closed and it eventually feeding through to uh, a national source of, of truth, to use that terminology. Thank you very much, Mr. Marks. Um, just move on to um, roads and recovery. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, the next question, I think, is mainly for Mr. Marks. Uh, Mr. Marks, has there been any feedback from the um, various associations in relation to the experience of individuals and businesses within the industry as to the d disaster recovery allowance? Uh, yes. So the one of the so the ATA General Council represents a number of other associations and businesses, um, both SARTA and WF, for example, are members of that body. And when the body considered the bushfires and what was needed in response back on the 20th of January, I believe it was, one of the, the main issues they decided on, on the need was for essentially a, a wage subsidy. So looking at the disaster recovery allowance, it, it's a payment for individuals whose income has been affected as a result of a major disaster. Uh, the maximum payment rate uh, is about the job equivalent to the job seeker payment or youth allowance rates. But as a result of, I guess, the current DRA arrangements, a bushfire affected business, including a trucking business, aren't use the DRA to subsidise the wages of its employees whilst it recovers from this short-term hit to its, its income. You know, this, you know, back in 2011, for example, there was you know, cyclones and floods in Queensland that the wage subsidy approach was used to some success. And, for example, in the response to the impacts of the coronavirus, uh, JobKeeper has, is, again, it's a wage subsidy mechanism to maintain that relationship between the business and its employees whilst they deal with the immediate impact. Mm. And that was a major uh, priority for our members. And it's it also in particular, it is, we, we believe it would assist employees who, you know, during what's a stressful time, having to lose your job and apply for disaster recovery allowance whilst you potentially have lost your home or you've been evacuated a number of times, as happened for some people, you know, it is a easier setup if you can just be maintained with your employer um, and they get some short-term assistance to do that. Were, were, were the members of the um, trucking industry particularly affected in Western Australia as a result of the fact that some of the areas were not declared disaster relief areas? Mm. Uh, yes. So the, the shires in Western Australia in particular that were impacted by the closure of the highway that Steve and Kim have spoken a lot about, um, you know, they, they were not disaster declared, which means even for like an owner driver who could have potentially been eligible under the disaster recovery allowance under the existing arrangements, uh, they, you know, were not able to apply for that assistance. And obviously, if you modelled a wage subsidy off the same payments, that would also not apply if you don't, you know, declare the, the impacted area as a disaster, which I guess takes us to a broader point that, you know, when you're making, when governments are making disaster declarations, there, there needs to be a consideration, not just, I guess, on property damage, but also on, you know, closure of major freight routes, uh, particularly the, the one 
between Perth and Adelaide, which was closed for, I believe it was up to, to two weeks. The CAM probably has more up-to-date information than that. Right. So thank you, Mr. Marks. Now, just one final question, I think it's for Mr. Dumsey. Mr. Dumsey, I, um, it may have been you who mentioned it, but I understand that once the air highway was reopened, there was a sort of convoy of some 285 vehicles and some 85 trucks that were eventually escorted. Uh, yes, that was actually, that's actually Mr. Shearer that had made that, that, that convoy, but it was, yeah, there was a convoy out. I'll, I'll let Mr. Shearer comment on that one. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shearer? Mm. Um, yes, the, um, to their credit, the authorities realised that for the safety of everyone involved, um, in, including the fact that in the areas that some of them were caught up, they were running out of all of the essentials from toilet paper through to um, food, um, and uh, attempts were made to understand where they were, as, as Mr Dumsey said before, but then to move them out. And they were moved out under a police escort, um, cars and trucks together, but in a, in a sequence um, to move them from areas where they were really stuck in quite remote areas and get them to a, a safer place um, where they could access all the things that human beings need to be able to access, including food and um, and water and you know, perhaps even a shower after a couple of weeks stuck out on the road. Um, but it was probably a more difficult exercise in getting that organised and started than it needed to be. And back to Mr Domesny's points, that if, if the authorities had communicated, engaged with us more, uh, they would have had a clearer picture earlier of where those... Um, gatherings of heavy vehicles were. Uh, it was also clear, though, uh, just in listening to the live-to-air radio interviews that were going on on the ABC and elsewhere, as they talked on air to anybody they could get hold of who was in the convoy, that there was quite um, mixed uh, information available to those individuals in the convoy from uh, various officials, including police, some were saying, well, we're going to move at this time and cars go first or trucks um, or, or whatever it might be. Um, and there was just quite a lot of confusion. Uh, it may have been better on the ground, uh, but I think it was just another snapshot of uh, the fact that officers on the ground were doing their best, but even perhaps within their own agency, they weren't really getting good information that enabled them to manage that as well as they would have liked to. Um, I, I, th I think it all, so much of this points back to the, the, you know, the inadequacies, inadequacies of communication, both in terms of timeliness and in terms of quality of information. Thank you, Mr. Sherry. And, gentlemen, I take it that the comments you've made in relation to road closures also apply in relation to road openings as well. Obviously, it's of, of importance for the industry to know when roads are closed, but also when they're yes. reopened. Is there any... Yes, that's, so, but that's particularly true. Um, the, we know that you can't always predict a bushfire and where it's going to go. Um, but indications of when it's likely to open, subject to um, you know, changes in wind direction or, or so on. Uh, floods are perhaps a better example where um, in the past, in our, in our north, we've had key routes uh, blocked by floods. Uh, the authorities have actually got a fairly good idea of historically and because of the information about that particular flood event that they'll be able to reopen that road in seven days' time. They might have to do some remedial work. Uh, knowing that as far as it can realistically be communicated is important to the operators for the reasons we mentioned before. Um, and sometimes it, it affects decisions such as, will freight be sent up to the north uh, east of our state uh, from Adelaide direction, or do they need to make alternative arrangements to bring the supplies in from Queensland from the other direction? Because at the end of the day, we're feeding people and supplying all the other things in their lives. But when you consider that just one truck company in Adelaide sends 125 B-doubles every night with fresh produce to Sydney and Melbourne, 
it gives you a, a hint of the scale of that cardiovascular task I talked about. Thank you very much, Mr. Shearer. Mr. Dumsey, any comments you wish to make? Mm. Yeah, look, I'll just pick up on Mr. Shearer's point. You know, it gets down to, we, we often speak about the trucks, but there's a, there's a human element to this. One of the problems about not knowing when the road's going to reopen is it directly impacts the company's ability to manage their drivers. It is not uncommon in Western Australia when we get road trains stuck in the northwest behind a wet season flood that it may be you know, seven days before it reopens that the companies will actually do all efforts to bring the drivers back either back home or back to a base. They'll effectively leave the trucks there. The problem we had with the air highway fires, given that the information flow was, was really bad, uh, was that drive companies were unable to make that decision. So they weren't sure when the road was going to reopen. There was one of our, it's a joint member of both Steve and mine, who actually uh, Adelaide based, but they run 50-odd uh, road trains on a constant cycle between Perth and Adelaide. Uh, they chose to fly their drivers back from Esperance to Perth and send them home. So the management of people is critical. The average age of our long-haul drivers now, particularly over here, is around 56 years old, extremely difficult to recruit, and the management and their welfare is becoming increasingly a, a priority. Prolonged periods of isolation where they're stuck sitting on the side of the road waiting for a fire or waiting for something else, nobody wants to sit uh, at, on, the, on the nullar ball there at a rest stop for, for five days waiting for a fire to open. It's not one of the primary world truest attractions. <laughs> but thank you, Mr. Damsey. Mr. Marks, any final comments you wish to make or any observations you wish to make on the question of uh, the reopening of roads? Mm. I mean, I certainly agree with uh, Steve and Cam's comments. Just expanding, I guess, one of Cam's points on the on the eastern seaboard and, and in South Australia, under the heavy vehicle national law, there's quite prescriptive rules around fatigue and how you, you manage that for drivers. Um, so, you know, it is quite an important consideration, both, you know, for their safety and, you know, in terms of their legal obligations. Thank you very much, Mr. Marks. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, Commissioners, those are my questions. I'm um, just wondering whether you might have some questions for the panel. Mm. No, I, I think that's, I've got one. A very frank and uh, an open discussion, and we've got a lot of points out of it, but I think for Mr Marks probably, and then uh, Mr Sheeran and Mr Dumsney, um, Mr Marks, in a national natural disaster scenario, which is what we, we saw, we saw a number of uh, hazards all coming together to create a national issue over the 2009 and 20 um, season, is there a greater role for your associations, particularly yours, and if there is, what is it? To, uh, to better make, better work the anatomy, uh, as Mr Shearer says, of, uh, of the transport system around uh, Australia. Thank you. Um, I mean, reflecting on, on the experience we came through in the 2019-2020 bushfires, um, our, I guess, one of our main focuses and priorities, especially on the, the road closure issue that has been discussed today, was just trying to point people towards where they would find the information. Um, and so the work of data and Western Roads, for example, was quite important for that because these are decisions that are made at the state level. So the state level bodies are usually the, you know, best equipped to, to find that out. Um, and then we would use our national reach, our communications reach and social media reach to try and amplify that messaging. Um, you know, if there was to be a single source of truth, to use that phrase again, on those sorts of issues, then that would make that job much easier to amplify that because each piece of messaging could point to the one source. That, that would be my, my okay, Mr. initial Mr. reaction. Thank, uh, thanks for that. Mr Shearer? Um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I, I think that is the key point. Um, if governments collectively, uh, and, and under COVID, we've seen probably the greatest degree of national coordination of governments that I've seen in the last 40 years in, in many ways, and it's been very positive despite a few wrinkles here or there, but fundamentally they've come together. If that same level of commitment is given uh, and sustained to the establishment and, and maintenance of a single source of truth, 
then our association network would find it far easier. Uh, and for us, it's, it's, it's not about bragging rights. It's not about saying we beat somebody to the punch. We have one role, and that is to provide the information reliably and as quickly as possible to the industry, our members and non-members, um, for the benefit of the country. So if we have a single national source, I, I would anticipate that a national body such as the Australian Trucking Association would take a lead in working at the national level and we would all work with them and through our networks, um, all you know, turf wars and petty jealousies would be put to the side uh, during a crisis and the country would be far better served. Uh, thank you. Mr Dumsney? Yeah, Commissioner, look, um, fundamentally our roads are maintained by our states, so effectively the way the nation's structured is that the roads are a, a state responsibility. The DFES or the Department of the Fire Emergency Services response agencies are state-based as well. So the issue you have then is how do you actually then, you know, from a national perspective, uh, get that flow of information. We because of the frequency of disruptions that we have in northern Australia, uh, because of the vulnerability of our, our single road out of the north, uh, we've got a, a very strong relationship already with the Northern Territory, uh, but effectively we're only talking about management of one sealed road and a couple of dirt roads. But it is how we get that information flow. But ultimately, information depends on the accuracy of the information that's flowing into it. The fundamental problem we face is, and it's no disrespect to the firefighters, it's no different to the military. If you're commanding a battle, you're focused on what's immediately in front of you. But if you're commanding the broader spectrum, you're looking at the wider aspects of it. Unfortunately, and the reality is that we tend to focus on the firefight and we don't have the structures in place nor the cultural dis um, cultural disposition, I suppose, uh, propensity to look at the broader aspects of what this road closure means. Uh, and we have focused singly on a road closure. If it had been the rail line, which uh, we call it the paddock, uh, if it had crossed the trans, cut the um, Adelaide to Perth rail line, we're talking 80% of the freight movements in and out of WA crossing that now. We would have had an even more severe disruption to Western Australia's uh, domestic supply. Uh, so we, we've, got, we've got to have a look at how we do it, but it starts at the base level of the of the contact reporting on the fire ground. No, I appreciate that. And it seems, from what you're saying, in a risk sense, people are focusing on one risk, but it doesn't necessarily seem that if people are focusing on the far broader risks that might be growing there and suddenly become a bigger yeah. issue than the than the what was the the, uh, the catalyst for it. So think, the, the, yep. exact, the exact right, Commissioner. The focus is on is on that thing, and the broader risk sector is largely falling under the radar. We were lucky in this sense that we did get away with it, uh, but this could have been far worse than what it was. Uh, thank you for that. <coughs> Commissioner Bennett. Thank you. I actually had the same uh, first question as the Chair did, so thank you for that. Um, I guess I want to try, try and see if I understand where, where we're going um, as a summary of the position. As I understand it, if you can get the information um, from a single source, preferably it has to be cross-border, national, because as you said, I think the roads don't don't close, don't stop at the border. Then your associations, either through the national body and or through the state bodies, can disseminate that information down to um, your, you know, the members and the and the various operators who can then get it through to the individual truck drivers, and that that works both for. Um, closing of roads and then again, then again opening of roads. That's that's one position as I understand it. But just picking up on what Mr. I think some of you have said and Mr. Shearer pointed out, that does not necessarily mean you have to be embedded, because that as long as there's that that that, that single source of information is updated and valid. But I also heard I thought there was another issue which isn't solved by that, which is what I would what seems to be at the recovery stage, if I can call it that. We're moving on from the direct response stage, which is the need for interaction between you and your members and um, a national body to understand how best you can uh, deliver goods then and what sort of goods you can deliver and where and how you can deliver them. Um, 
once once the immediate um, emergency is passed, and that uh, you would see that as the second and important exchange of information. Did, did I have that right? Uh, Mr uh, Shearer, I think you raised it first. I'll go to you first, actually. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yes, I agree. The way you have um, characterised that is that those two key points I absolutely agree with. And to illustrate the second point, um, we raised in our, our submission the, um, the great frustration we felt as an industry when following the Kangaroo Island fires having been brought under control, our industry did what it always does and immediately stepped forward to help. Um, offering free transport, which means the truck operators paying for the truck, the driver and the fuel to take recovery materials to Kangaroo Island. Um, but Kangaroo Island's across the water and you need to get on the ferry. And they were being told by Seedlink, the ferry operator, that there was quite a substantial fee for that. Yes, I think you elaborate. I, 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 thank you for reminding me because I think you set that out quite efficiently in your in your statement. Yeah. Yes, but, but so the difficulty is that we can be actively involved in a helpful way in the response and recovery, both for ourselves and the community, um, and it does, in, it does require engagement. And I think perhaps a critical point that, that you've made, um, and I, I made a, a brief reference to it in my earlier comments, we can't realistically expect, no matter how well-intentioned, police officers and emergency service people and government officials to be aware that something that's being considered or discussed has transport implications, either problems or things that we can help with. So a real benefit of having and, and um, somebody embedded from the trucking industry with that expertise is we can avoid problems but also add some solutions. And we're missing that if we don't have somebody in the room even if most of the time they're just listening. But that would be um, as much at the, at the um, not so much at the emergency level, but that would be the recovery stage too, wouldn't it? Uh, it, it certainly it can be both. Um, I think the longer-term role is in the recovery exactly. stage. But depending on the nature of the emergency, there will be instances such as the, um, the water truck tanker issue that I mentioned earlier, um, where that's part of the actual response in fighting the fire. Um, most of the time, though, it, it would be primarily focused on the recovery stage. Thank you very much. I don't know if, if either Mr Marks or Mr Demain would wish to add to that, but I, I, I think they're just nodding happily. Yeah, nothing to add. No, just the only point I'd make is in the recovery phase is that part of our role is that we, we tend to focus on the flow through movements. We've also got a continued role in supplying communities mm. and in particular our remote communities. Well that's very much what I had in mind. Yeah, so particularly in our roadhouse areas which on on our remote and regional roads are effectively oases and that's where people tend to congregate but they need to be resupplied as well um, and they need to be recovered. So particularly on the air highway when it reopened, they'd actually run out of fuel or something near enough to it. So we've actually got to get fuel trucks out there in order to put fuel back in the bowsers in order to enable the cars and the, the, the travellers to have the sufficient fuel to get through to, to June or all into Norseman where it was yeah. appropriate. So there are elements there where the transport industry brings value. The final point, though, Commissioner, is if this crisis had occurred during... I'll pick up on Mr Shearer's point of why we need to be embedded or we should be. Um, if this crisis had occurred during the COVID period, um, we would have had the instance that the uh, road trains bringing the flu vaccines for Western Australia would have been held up at the fire ground. And the fire emergency services would have been unaware of that. It's only through the industry that we pass that information on. It could have been the N95 face masks that they needed as well, which would be, could have been resupplied. There are any number of things that we're bringing across on the back of the truck, which may actually be needed either for the community or in terms of fighting the particular fire or natural disaster. That's what the industry associations also bring to the table. Thank you very much. I found I found all of your um, insights very valuable. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. It, uh, it has proved to be a very good discussion. I appreciate you spending the time with us. Thank you. Mr Tokley. 
Uh, Chair, if the uh, witnesses could please be released from their summons. Yes, they may be released from their summons. And thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate the time once again. And, Chair, thank that, con you. that concludes you. this panel thank this morning. Um, if we could now adjourn for lunch and perhaps resume at 2 o'clock, if that's convenient. We'll resume at 2 o'clock, mm. and uh, at which stage we'll also, during the break, we'll look at uh, how we pick up the ABC sometime today as well. Uh, all right, we'll adjourn now until 1400 Canberra time. Thank you. All rise.
Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr. Sackley. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Please proceed. Chair, thank you. Commissioners, um, this afternoon we'll be having a panel on roads uh, with representatives from the various states, in fact, five states. Um, Queensland, Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia and Western Australia. There are a number of persons we are calling for this purpose. I might just call them now. Um, so, first of all, Mr Paul Northey, who's the Chief Regional Roads Department of Transport, Victoria. Mr Chris Stephenson, the Deputy Commissioner, Emergency Management, Victoria. Mr Chris London, who's the Executive Director, Road Tech, Department of Transport and Main Roads in Queensland, Mr Rod Staples, Secretary, Department of Transport, Transport for New South Wales, New South Wales, Mr John Dynan, who's the Acting Executive Director, Community in Place, Transport for New South Wales, New South Wales, and Mr Graham Brown, Director, Road Asset Management Services, Department of Planning and Transport and Infrastructure in South Australia, and Mr Desmond Snook, the Acting Managing Director of Main Roads in Western Australia. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Mm. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, gentlemen, I just have each of you sworn in or take the oath as the case may be. Uh, Mr. Northey, I understand you're taking the oath. Mm. That's correct. Mr. Northey, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Mr. Chris Stephenson. Mm. Mr. Stephenson, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Mr. Chris Lunson, who is also taking the oath. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lunson, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rod Staples, who's taking the oath? Mm. Mr. Staples, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. John Dynan, who's taking the affirmation? Mm. Mr. Dynan, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Graham Brown, who's taking the oath. Mr. Brown, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I'm sorry, Mr. Brown, I didn't hear you. I do. Thank you. Oh, and um, Mr. Desmond Snook. Mm. Mr. Snook, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, the first thing I'd like to do is to get you to introduce yourselves and your roles and responsibilities within your various departments. And if I could please start in the order in which you were sworn in, was Mr. With Mr. Northey. Mm. So uh, my uh, title is Chief Regional Roads Officer with uh, Regional Roads Victoria. Um, just for the sake of completeness, Regional Roads Victoria, uh, up until 1st of July last year, was part of uh, Vic Roads, the regional part of Vic Roads. Uh, we're now incorporated into the Department of Transport. Uh, so I'll be representing all of the Department of Transport of Victoria today. In terms of uh, uh, Regional Roads Victoria, we're responsible for operating and maintaining approximately 19,000 kilometres of uh, highway and arterial roads in regional Victoria. Thank you. Uh, Miss, Mr Stephenson? Mm -hmm. Yes, so hi, Chris Stephenson. Um, I'm the Deputy Emergency Management Commissioner. Um, for operational coordination. So my primary role on behalf of the Commissioner is to provide coordination in relation to um, preparedness, response, relief and recovery for major emergencies in Victoria. And, and certainly that includes emergencies like we saw the bushfire season uh, 1920. Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> Mr. Lunson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good day. My name is Christopher Lunson. I'm the uh, Executive Director from Road Tech, Department of Transport and Main Roads, Queensland. Um, I've got operational experience from a number of uh, different disasters across the state. I've also worked in different sections across the state, currently based in Brisbane. Thank you, Mr. Lunson. And Mr. Staples. Uh, so yes, Rod Staples, I'm the Secretary of, the Trans of Transport for New South Wales. Uh, so we are responsible for all the strategic policy planning and operation of the transport network for the state. It covers roads, rail and maritime elements as well as uh, active transport and, and all other elements. So I sit as one of the secretaries in the department. We, within government, we work to, in the context of fires uh, here to, and other natural disasters, through the State Emergency Operations Centre, you know, with other lead combat agencies overall. Thank you. Uh, Mr Dynan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's John Dynan. I'm the Acting Executive Director of Community in Place for the Department of Trans with Transport for New South Wales. At the time, I was the Acting Executive Director for Regional Freight, which meant I had the responsibility for road operations, maintenance and construction across regional New South Wales, of which the bushfires affected. Thank you. And Mr Brown? Um, well, I'm currently the Director of Road Asset Management Services within the Department of Planning, Transport and Infrastructure. My role is um, in regards to the asset management and maintenance of the road network, which is approximately 13,000 um, kilometres of sealed roads and 10,000 kilometres of unsealed roads. I'm also the State Transport Commander for emergency management purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Brown. And Mr Snook? Uh, I'm the Acting Managing Director for Main Roads. Uh, in that role, I'm responsible for the state road network in Western Australia that covers all freeways, highways and main roads and has a length of approximately 18,500 kilometres. Uh, in my substantive position, uh, I'm also responsible for uh, the statewide crisis and incident management uh, function. Thank you, Mr Snook. Uh, gentlemen, there are a number of topics I'll be asking you questions on today. Uh, the first of those topics concerns the provision of road closure information to the public and the sharing of information uh, at the borders between the various states. Uh, one reason for this is because of the feedback that we've received and the uh, various submissions that have come in concerning the provision of road closure information. Uh, for this purpose, I'll be putting up on the screen um, some extracts from some of the documents that we've received. The purpose of this is not to single out any one particular state, it's to help guide the uh, questioning uh, so that each of you are able to address the same issues uh, in a way that's relevant to your particular jurisdiction. So um, what I'd like to do first of all is to start with Victoria and for that purpose could I please have up on the screen document emv.0007.0001.0001 and if I could please have highlighted paragraph 354.2 sorry 354.2 and and obviously uh, Mr Norley and Mr Stevenson this is a addressed this is the Victorian document and in, in relation to this paragraph, if you, I would like you to elaborate upon the fact that the department provides information uh, via the system Vic Traffic, but also the um, phone application that you have, and then the uh, problems experienced during the last bushfire season, which is covered in the second of the, of the, the sentences in that paragraph, third, third of sentences in that paragraph. Mm. Yes, yeah, so I, I can address that. So, uh, one of our primary, one of the Department of Transport's primary roles in Victoria in the event of a, a bushfire is to uh, provide uh, road closure information via our Vic Traffic and uh, website and app, uh, as well as overall communication uh, responsibilities. Uh, which we did in, in the event of this uh, bushfire that took place. Um, 
in terms of the connection to Google Maps, um, leading up to the fire, um, Google Maps was, or the base layer of Google Maps was linked to our Vic Traffic uh, website and app. Uh, the reason being that um, that Google Apps application enables uh, users to be able to plan their journeys and also to see traffic congestion. Uh, the Vic Traffic app, uh, its primary role is to show road closures and maintenance activity on our arterial road network. Um, leading up to the, in, in 2019, um, uh, Google Maps, uh, uh, we understand, made a change uh, to how they uh, operated their um, their application and that they would actually um, sometimes generate their own road closure data. So not information that was provided through our website, but that might be, say, user-generated uh, data. Um, it became apparent uh, during the event um, early on that uh, some of that information was incorrect in terms of road closures. Uh, hence, uh, early in January, we actually uh, disconnected the link from Google Maps to uh, the Vic Traffic application. And so, uh, again, the Vic Traffic uh, application became the, the key uh, communication tool in terms of uh, road closures um, throughout the bushfire event. Thank you. Now, the, the road closures that are identified in paragraph 354.2, I think you said they were the arterial roads? Yeah, so, so the primary role of the Vic Traffic uh, website and app is to provide uh, road closure and maintenance information on our arterial road network. Uh, during a, a bushfire event, um, we will take the information from the situation reports that are prepared uh, through uh, the incident control centres and then through the state control centre. Um, so that becomes the, I guess, the source of truth, which we will then communicate out to the uh, to the public. Um, but also during an event, we will also, if it's provided, um, show information on local roads. So just to be clear. Um, we manage the arterial road network, the Department of Transport, local government uh, manages uh, local roads. So um, if that information is provided, we will show that on our uh, application during the event. Um, the accuracy of which obviously we're relying on the information provided uh, through the uh, various incident control centres, uh, information provided by local government and emergency services. Thank you, Mr. Northey. Um, if I might now go to um, New South Wales, it may be a question from Mr. Staples or Mr. Dynan. Um, take, taking the paragraph 354.2 just as a guide, uh, gentlemen, does New South Wales have the equivalent of a Vic Traffic Act? I understand it might be the New South Wales Live Traffic. Is that correct? Mm. Yes, we do have a, a, a application similar in feature to the Vic Traffic called New South Wales Live Traffic, uh, and that was very actively used during the course of the fire season. And uh, we have continued to use that. We've done a major upgrade on that in recent months uh, to provide some more enhanced information in relation to that. Dim to Victoria, its primary purpose is about providing information on incidents, accidents, maintenance activities on the major state road network. Uh, but in the course of major emergencies, that information expands out to provide all the information provided via the State Emergency Operations Centre around uh, road closures and so forth so that we have a full picture. That information can be um, an actual road closure. It can actually also, uh, we have sort of enhanced it to include information such as indicating roads being at risk of closure as well to give uh, people or the community that are travelling the opportunity to understand that if they start to go in a particular direction, there is some risk, and we, that was an enhancement that we introduced as part of this fire season. The data that feeds New South Wales live traffic is actually also made available on what we call an open data platform, or what we call third-party providers, and Google Maps is one of those third-party providers that is available for them to then access and use. 
So that that was actively used during the, this fire season, without a doubt. So Google Maps, Waze, Apple Maps are just a, a couple of examples in relation to that. What we found during the fire season was that the road closure information, so roads closing, we actually found very good alignment with. Google Maps and some other providers did have difficulty and delays in giving information about when roads had reopened. So there was some issues with data flow and, and data connectivity uh, around the reopening of roads, and so that caused mismatches between the information on our New South Wales live traffic app and what was being displayed on some of the third-party apps. Uh, we've worked pretty strongly with those pr providers since the fire season and expect to have some upgrades to the data transfer in the, in the weeks and months ahead so that over the next few months we expect that to be much more aligned in an automatic way. We did address it during the, the course of the fire season by doing some manual updates to workarounds once we identified that problem. So the issue did become less uh, as we got into the fire season, but it still was a mismatch. So I could understand in some instances a community member would be looking at one app and getting one piece of information and looking at another one and getting another piece of information. But we have upgraded that information uh, data sources quite dramatically over the last few months and we'll continue to do so over the course of this year. Thank you, Mr Staples. Mr Staples, I understand that there was quite an increase in traffic, um, sorry, volume of, so certainly, volume of hits. Yeah, yeah, as, <laughs> yeah, as you would expect uh, when there's a lot of interest in a, a lot of people and uh, community members travelling around, there was a lot of interest in what roads were open and closed. Mm -hmm. So we did find that because we had an older web-based web system at the time that we did have troubles with volume, the way we dealt with that was to turn off all of the, the non-relevant information. So in the background, there's a lot of information when you zoom in in any part of the state about upcoming roadworks, for example, that people might want to be planning their trip and they can see when that's planned for a night closure somewhere on a road. So we just turned all of that data off um, to provide enough bandwidth so that we could, we could manage. So we didn't have any problems in terms of outages uh, or people being able to access. We just needed to adapt to the situation. The update that we've done with our website is a very significant technology technology improvement over the last few months. So we've actually got much more bandwidth capacity now to be able to deal with higher volumes. Uh, although we do expect a lot of the community members do want to use those third party applications like Google Maps because they use them for other things as well as you know, in, in bushfire uh, information in bushfire season. So we'll continue to work to make sure that we've got that alignment. Thank you, Mr. Staples. I might just bring up a document to RMS dot zero zero one dot zero zero one dot double zero one four and if I could have the top four bullet points please uh, and Mr Staples you, you will recognize this as the New South Wales document um, and it mentions the increased volume of hits on the on the live traffic act in the first dot point but you'll see, and I'm interested in also the fact that it, in addition to the live traffic app, there were also communications and the other three dot points that are mentioned there. So you had uh, variable mes message signs, um, you had uh, information about closures and reopenings were sent to, in the third dot point, DPC, the New South Wales RFS <coughs> and others. And then you also had SMSs being sent to heavy vehicle operators as well. Hmm. Yes, so the context for that is that obviously our live traffic app is a really important source of information. And as the, the first bullet point shows, the increase was dramatic in that period. But there's a couple of things in the context of that. We're highly aware that telecommunications was vulnerable and people didn't always have access to that. So that was a critical thing for us. And you know, Operationally, we always have a number of channels that we provide information. The, the app is becoming increasingly used, but if you're on the road, then we don't want people looking at their phone. So the VMS is a very important source. So we deployed a lot of temporary VMS. So they're those little trailer-based VMS, and we deployed them at key decision points for uh, motorists so that they could actually make decisions about their trip depending on where they were going to give the updated information. And we, we regularly updated those. We also have a number of uh, fixed VMSs which we can update automatically very quickly. So that was a key information source and that was across the state. So if I was leaving Sydney driving towards the south coast and the fires were on, you would be getting messages not to travel to the south coast, for example, to make sure that that information was out there. 
We also uh, recognise that a number of people access information through industry associations and other channels. And so the Trucking Industry Association being a really important one and some of the key logistics companies. So regular email updates. We would have had uh, a dozen updates a day in the height of the, the season around individual road closures and that information going out so that they could then feed that into their channels, Twitter and other uh, areas as well. And then obviously the, the heavy vehicle one was very important. We've got a number of examples where we worked with trucking industry companies where we needed to get critical supplies in, where we would give them advance notice about reopening of roads you know, that we expect them in 10, 12, 14 hours so that they could actually do their route planning in advance. We got better at, over the fire season, if I'm honest, as, as, things, as we learned, we got better and better at sort of being able to get that information out uh, over time. Thank you very much, Mr. Staples. Could I please bring back up um, the document EMV 0007.001.0080? And again, if you could please highlight paragraph 354.2. And again, gentlemen, this is just by way of assistance. Um, Queensland, Mr. Lunson, did, does Queensland have the equivalent of a Vic Traffic um, Website? Yes. It uh, yeah. Mm. yeah, sure. We've got uh, our Queensland traffic app. Uh, it's all, we also have a website, and there's also a, a phone number, um, 131940, um, which which was the origin, original source of information, um, similar to what uh, some of the other presenters have, have given. Uh, we went through a review of services after the statewide floods in uh, 10, 11, 12, and those services had a significant upgrade um, to what we've got today. So with regard to Queensland traffic, um, certainly from the app interface, users of that app are sent push information uh, similar to in Trans Transport for New South Wales case. Um, we also have seven Twitter feeds which provide uh, specific information to those particular users around the network conditions. Um, the Queensland traffic app, uh, similar to the other apps mentioned, has an interface um, with Google Maps and other sources of information. It's an open source of data, um, so it's available for people to use, uh, and we treat our data as the source of truth uh, for others to use. Uh, that information is also shared across borders uh, in that format, and similarly, um, I believe the transport for New South Wales information being open source, we will also represent uh, some of that information within our own app for, for travellers that are crossing the border. Thank you, Mr Lanson. Now, in terms of the roads that are identified on the Queensland app, what sort of roads are those? Mm -hmm. Primarily, we're dealing with a state-controlled road network because um, from a departmental point of view, that is the primary information we're dealing with. However, in saying that, we have local governments who will also publish information and we will put that through our website, Queensland Traffic, as well. Um, that will come down to the level of sophistication of the local government. So uh, in South East Queensland, we have uh, Brisbane City Council, a very sophisticated, large organisation. Um, they, they are part of our TMC structure, so that information is openly shared. Um, uh, to be honest, we have some challenges in the more remote areas, um, and that is more around getting information as quickly as what our customers would like to have it. Um, you know, and members of the public, their expectations are fairly high. Um, but in those, certainly in those remote areas, um, it can be a challenge in drawing that information forward in a you know, timely manner. Thank you. It, it is, is the same information... Um so is the same uh, traffic uh, app used for both floods and bushfires? Is it in all hazards matter? Hmm. Uh, it's all incidents on the road network. So it could be a, a truck overturning uh, and causing delays on the network. It could be a uh, planned road work site. Um, it could be a bushfire or a flood. Thank you, Mr Lunson. Um, Mr Brown from South Australia, is there an equivalent system in South Australia? 
Uh, indeed, there is. It's very similar to the other jurisdictions. Um, slight difference is that what we call the control agency, who is responsible for managing the event, um, manages the communications, and our department provides support to them. We have what we call Traffic SA, which is, a, again, a web-based graphical representation of, of road closures across the state. Um, for both all those roads under the care, control and management of the Commissioner of Highways. Um, that can also include um, council information. Uh, information flows through to what we call the control agency and that uh, information is then displayed uh, on our um, uh, Traffic SA site. We similarly have an app um, which I think most jurisdictions um, have used um, similar to ours, which is called Ad Insight, which provides real-time information about events across the network. Um, we also have um, we, the use of Facebook, Twitter, those sorts of things, variable message signs as well, um, and obviously radio and TV news sources um, supplement that. We also have a specific alert to various industry bodies um, that um, subscribe or um, we have identified as being um, key um, stakeholders uh, in the event of a road closure. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, Graham, we heard earlier today from the uh, Transport um, Association of South Australia. Is there um, information provided to the heavy vehicle in industry um, directly? Uh, you know? yeah. Uh, yes, there are. yes, uh, it is. So we provide email alerts um, to various um, freight-specific bodies and organisations, including SARTA. Hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr Snook, the equivalent in Western Australia? Hmm. Uh, in, in Western Australia, the, um, where there is a, 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 a major incident um, uh, involving... Uh, uh, our, our department for uh, the DFES department for foreign emergency services. Uh, the information on on the roads, on the state road and network, will go onto our travel map. That's that's a, the travel map is uh, based on the main roads website. However, it, there is no um, app associated with that. It's just based on the website. So the information goes out through the uh, through the travel map. Uh, we also put out uh, uh, an email broadcast uh, 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 about the particular incident uh, that goes out to uh, to, to media uh, and other other uh, locations. Uh, we also put information out through Facebook and through Twitter. Uh, we run a 24/7 customer information centre where people can phone in and get the information. Uh, and uh, we also do uh, have uh, trailer-mounted variable message signs uh, around particular uh, inf uh, incidents, if that's required. And then with regards to um, information that goes out to the road transport in industry, if it is a, uh, a major incident, uh, then we will put uh, the information uh, from our, our um, uh, travel email broadcast, we'll put that out to... Uh, uh, a separate uh, heavy vehicle services uh, uh, emails that they go to um, uh, road transport uh, companies. Thank you, Mr. Snook. Mm. Uh, could I please have um, paragraph 354.4 highlighted? And um, Mr. Northey, Mr. Stevenson. You'll see in this paragraph that the department identified a number of challenges, uh, as it says, associated with communication of consistent and accurate road status and access information in geographical areas involving borders between states. Um, if I could ask, ask you to elaborate upon that paragraph in terms of um, some of the specific uh, difficulties that you had, and then I take it from um, what we already know that the uh, Victorian La Vic Traffic Act actually stops at the borders? That's correct, yes. So our app covers um, Victoria, obviously. So what we do with our app in terms of providing information across borders is that our traffic management centre will liaise with their counterparts in other states um, so that if a road 
uh, closure extends into another state, uh, we will include that uh, via an icon on our app. So a user, say, travelling from Victoria to New South Wales, uh, would see the road closure information shown for our app and then when they when it gets to the border, there would be an icon saying that um, the road is, uh, continues to be closed for a certain number of kilometres. So I think this paragraph really goes to the heart of the fact that if people are travelling uh, across states, uh, that they do need to use more than uh, one source of information. Uh, so there is not a holistic uh, approach in terms of um, providing information in terms of road closures uh, during an event. Mm -hmm. If I can, I might add uh, to Paul's point there that um, it wasn't a single source of information in relation to uh, road closures, so we also attempted um, to inform communities through local broadcasters um, and through local meetings and also basically putting people in small towns even to communicate to travellers the current conditions. Um, I think there are a few challenges in relation to how we categorise um, road closures. Um, Victoria, we have a specific um, set of uh, procedures around road closures um, to help guide incident controllers who ultimately are the ones that um, determine those road closures so that we can clearly communicate that status. Um, and I am aware that that is inconsistent across jurisdictions. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, uh, if I could uh, go to uh, New South Wales, Mr Stables, Mr Dynan, because obviously you're a bordering state with Victoria. Uh, does the New South Wales Live Traffic Act stop at the border? Mm. So we obviously have uh, borders with Victoria, South Australia, Queensland, as well as ACT. Yes. At this point in time today, the information from Victoria is not shared on our New South Wales live traffic app, but as you I think heard earlier in evidence, it does share Queensland information mm -hmm. at this stage, and we are working on accessing the Victorian data over the next few months to be able to display uh, Victorian information as well in terms of road closures and so forth to give a, a better picture for those that are in and around the border. I think the other thing that I would say uh, on top of this is that <clears throat> we don't see any one application or one website as being the solution. Having consistent data is very important, but then providing that to various platforms in a consistent way I think is the really critical solution in the future. So it shouldn't matter whether a user is on you know, an individual state-based app or on a proprietary third-party app that they've got the same information. and. The power of the Apple Maps and the Google Maps is that they don't know state boundaries, but they source information from individual states and then they can put that information together. So I gave in evidence earlier some mismatches in data that we identified between our, our true data and what Google Maps display. Addressing that will be a very important step for customers to be able to rely on information that goes across borders because the, the Google Maps is a, essentially a national coverage as is, as is Apple Maps and so forth. So we're working on wanting to be able to display all of the states and other bordering into our application if people choose to use our app. But we'd also recognise that a large portion of our, um, our communities actually use those third party apps and we've got to get that data feed absolutely correct as well. Mm -hmm. And is, is that work ongoing at the moment? Yes, it is, and I expect that we will have rectified any of those data disconnects in the weeks and months ahead. We're certainly aiming to have that ready in advance of any sort of further fire seasons coming up. And the, the paragraph also mentioned that the, the use of different symbols, and do you see that there, there can be agreement on the use of symbols quite quickly? Certainly, we could look at that across states. I'm not aware of what work we've done on that. I think the important thing is that what we don't want people to have to do is switch between applications. So if they're always working off the same application and they're familiar with that, then I think that's the most important thing. Because bear in mind, uh, the, the symbol library for a Google Maps or an Apple Maps is actually a global symbol library. Uh, whereas a New South Wales or Victorian one, yes, there's potentially some opportunity to rationalise those, but our objective here is for them to not to have to switch between different applications, but to be able to rely on the one 
application for anything in and around borders. Thank you, Mr Staples. Uh, Mr Brown, I might go to you next because South Australia uh, borders, obviously, Victoria and uh, New South Wales, uh, Queensland and um, the Northern Territory. And I take it that the South Australian app also ends at the borders? Uh, it does. So the, at this present point, um, the app stops at borders, um, but information is shared between traffic management centres between jurisdictions. Uh, is that through a formal information sharing arrangement or an ad hoc or informal arrangement? Um, not quite sure. I'd have to take that question on notice. Okay, thank you. Um, and Mr Lunson from Queensland, uh, obviously you have borders with the Northern Territory, um, South Australia uh, New and New South Wales. Um, yeah. Does, does the Queensland app stop at the borders? Uh, no, we certainly share information across the border with New South Wales and, and our app will refer to New South Wales information. The, the border with South Australia is... Um, uh, it's crossing points pretty minor, so we don't share information there. But what we will do is put up variable message signs notifying of a closure uh, in that part of the network. Um, and I'm not aware of a sharing information with the Northern Territory as such. Well, our information is shared, but I'm not aware of us sharing their information. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the uh, symbols that are used, are yours the same as New South Wales? Well, that, that's a very good question. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to answer, um, but I certainly think if it's not, uh, it's a, there's an opportunity that it could be. Thank you, Mr Lunson. And, and Mr Snook from Western Australia, obviously you share borders with South Australia and also the Northern Territory. I take it that the Western Australian equivalent ends at the borders as well? Yeah. Uh, that's right. The, the thing, as I explained, is we, we don't have an app. Ours is a, um, a, a website-based uh, based system. Uh, the information uh, that we have is the WA uh, information. Although, um, if, uh, uh, for instance, um, in the, the fires that occurred uh, along Air Highway, uh, we do make uh, contact with um, we make contact with South Australia to get messages out to the uh, road transport industry in South Australia uh, that we had um, uh, road closures uh, further along Air Highway within WA. And, and uh, put up they put up variable message signs to um, uh, advise the road transport industry to uh, and not not to proceed across the border. Thank you, Mr. Snook. Um, commissioners, I'll be moving on to a separate topic from the one I've just concluded on. You may have some questions as a result of the um, answers provided on the first topic. Uh, we've been heavily googling apps and uh, and looking at the differences across the the states, which has helped the. Uh, yeah, we won't provide that as evidence, but uh, <laughs> as, which has helped the, the discussion. Mm. We appreciate the, that, and it's fairly consistent with uh, with the evidence that we've had so far. I'll just ask the commissioners, Commissioner McIntosh, Commissioner Bennett. Um, I'm just a bit more. In, I'm intrigued a little by um, the information that's available and the evidence we had this morning about the difficulties for the um, the trucking industry, if I can call it that, to act access information about road closures and um, we heard about it specifically in Western Australia and South Australia and I just I, 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 I'm having difficulty in, under, in, in um, matching the two can are you did you I don't know if you're aware of the of the um, of the evidence that was uh, put on by the by the various associations the national one and the South Australian Western and Western Australian but if, if, in fact, all of this information is readily available, how is it that the trucking industry doesn't know what the road closures are and when they're open? Any, anyone want to make a comment about that? <laughs> um, perhaps I can probably lead it a little bit further. I think building on Commissioner Bennett's comments there, I think one of the issues I had this morning was the predictive nature of road closures. So from what your, each of the states are saying at the moment, you've, you've talked about what has happened and what is happening, how 
are you placed to provide advice on the future of the road network, if that makes sense? If we just go around the around the ether there and start with Queensland, do you have a way of providing forward-looking information from an emergency point of view, i.e. Oh, the road should be clear at this point or it will be closed for that length of time or something along those, those lines? Yeah, so that would depend on the type of disaster activity we're dealing with. Um, we have interfaces with the Bureau of Meteorology um, and obviously depending on whether we're at what type of alert situation we're at, we'll be feeding into the local disaster management group or the district disaster management group, gathering information and intel from the other agencies and then applying that to the road network. Um, I'm probably more thinking from a, certainly from a bomb point of view, um, we've got a lot of um, gauges or they have a lot of gauges within river systems and creeks that so gives us intelligence around what's happening on the network and we're able to predict based on river height and how quickly that is rising. We know the level of our structures. If a road is going to be closed in the near future, and we will proactively move forward to uh, monitor that section of the network more closely. Similarly, uh, we also have um, CCTV cameras established in what we call uh, hot areas, where we know uh, that net part of the network has given us problems in the past. Uh, and if we're aware there's a potential event about to occur, we're able to monitor that location um, you know, directly. Um, there is, the overall process does rely on, and I might sort of refer back to what the Commissioner was saying or asking earlier, it, it does rely on a lot of intelligence coming in and then being able to make sense of that intelligence to then proactively populate the mapping system or app that we're using. Um, so it's, we will always work, uh, act with, in caution because we're concerned about the safety of the road user. So we are gathering a lot of information proactively. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Uh, South Australia, and I noticed from the backdrop there you can oversight most of the roads from your office. Correct. <laughs> um, look, the, uh, the issue I think that we have with regards to the predictive nature of, of disaster events is that they are in most times unpredictable. Um, whilst we can have good intelligence that it helps to inform um, our risk assessments, um, the nature of the event um, can be sometimes quite difficult in predicting uh, an exact um, point in time when, a, when an opening um, of a road can occur or even a closing, closure of a road. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question about whether one provides um, uh, information with a degree of inaccuracy to the general public or one provides as good a detail as possible um, to ensure that there are no um, unplanned um, um, incursions back into um, disaster areas that still may not be safe from a risk management perspective. Um, we do provide um, um, information from all of the agencies to inform the risk assessment process and South Australian um, emergency services organisations are now looking at consolidating all of that information into one um, um, platform um, that will provide real-time situational um, information to um, during disaster events which will help guide that predictive modelling that you're discussing. Uh, th thanks for that and I'll go to Western Australia uh, same same question and how you might put that information out to people, noting that in the 2019-20 fires, it was the fires in Dundas that was causing the backlog back across the the, uh, the the border. How are you plugged into the broader emergency management system and so are you aware that a road's about to be closed? If you are, how do you get that information out in a timely manner? Yes, uh, with the um, uh, the the fires at uh, on Air Highway and the Kilgardie Esperance Highway uh, around Christmas, uh, the Department for Fire and Emergency Services is the hazard management agency for that one, uh, and Main Roads is uh, is is a support agency for them. So we uh, we are closely uh, linked to. Uh, uh, the, the Department of Foreign Emergency Services 
at the local level, at the district level, and also at the state level. So in, in that particular uh, fire, what, what was, uh, became a problem was it actually wasn't one fire, it was a, a number of individual fires that were, were moving around and the weather conditions meant that the fires were moving uh, sometimes in, uh, in un unpredictable directions. So, so the, the, the issue was uh, not so much being able to get uh, messages out about the um, uh, closures of roads. It, it, it was actually trying to... Uh, for it, the, the issue was for uh, DFES in, in association with the Bureau of Meteorology to try and, and, and be predictive on, on when, those, um, uh, when, when the roads might have been opened. And, and, and that, that was very difficult. And in total, there was, uh, it was a 12-day uh, stretch when the, uh, when the road was closed. And, and I think that, that was more the issue, the duration of the closure uh, and, and the fact that um, uh, really it, it was not possible to predict uh, uh, when, when, when the road was going to be reopened because of the variability of the, um, uh, the weather conditions that were playing on uh, you know, possibly half a dozen different fires at different locations along the, uh, along the road. Okay, th thanks for that. I'll, uh, I may come back to, to Western Australia in a, in, a, in a minute. But if we go to, uh, to New South Wales, similar, similar question. So, yeah, certainly we acknowledge the importance of the trucking industry in a natural disaster, such as a bushfire, and the importance of moving logistics around, whether it be fuel, gro you know, grocery supplies and so forth, particularly getting them to communities. So they are a big focus for us in terms of being able to support and manage them. And from the very start, you know, we were engaged with the trucking industry when the fire started in the north of the state and you know, ran through right to the south. I would characterise the interaction through the different parts of a, a fire event. Uh, when you're moving into an event uh, on our, if, with the information we provide the industry is closures or the potential for closures. So what we don't want to do is have large numbers of trucks moving into an area where there's likely to be a closure. So working with RFS, we do provide some level of uh, warning about potential uh, closure areas. And obviously, if closures occur, then that information is available. I think where uh, we see some, some opportunity going forward is in the, the reopening phase uh, around the information to give uh, trucking companies enough information to choose the routes that they might choose to make the decision about when a truck might leave a logistics centre to be able to get to a destination because what they don't want to do is get halfway there and find the truck stranded um, somewhere along the line. So we, to give you an example of a process we went through, Batemans Bay down on the south coast was stranded on a number of occasions in terms of access. Uh, before Christmas, the Princess Highway to the north was cut a number of times. And most of the supplies into Bayman's Bay come from Sydney or Canberra. And as a result of that, those fires, the trucking companies could not access through that route. So they started sending trucks via the Snow Mountains Highway, which is almost double the length of trip and required a completely different driver fatigue management. Um, so we understood the importance of being able to get that resolved. So we worked very hard to, to determine a, uh, a planned open date for the, the roads to the north of Batemans Bay and kept the industry informed about that so that they could make decisions about when their trucks would leave, which route that they would be going with confidence. The Queensland gave some evidence about the, the complication of that is that it's dynamic and the, the really unprecedented number of fires we had at any one time. So the ability to predict a reopening reliably was probably more challenging this time than we're used to. And that would certainly have made it difficult for us to give timely information to the trucking industry from time to time. What we certainly did uh, in some instances around critical supplies, so fuel, supermarket goods, um, through our State Emergency Operations Centre, we actually worked with those industry suppliers. Uh, we organised for those trucks to go to a holding point at the closure um, so that they were ready to be escorted in so that we could get critical supplies in at key locations. So there was a lot of coordination effort for critical supplies with trucking companies where we saw that need, and that was done at a whole estate coordination level. So. 
Um, you know, if we hadn't been able to get fuel into Bateman's Bay, the holiday makers that we asked to leave would not been able would not have been able to leave because they didn't have fuel, for example. So we did prioritise our engagement with the, the trucking industry around those supplies that we thought were most critical to support their response. Oh, thanks for that. It was a good good answer, Victoria. Yeah, so there were a number of layers to this for Victoria this year, and I suppose our approach started even before um, the fires um, were ignited. And, and one of the things we predicted was significant road closures due to the severity of the fire season that we we, we knew we were going to experience and, and looking uh, north of our border, seeing what was happening in other jurisdictions. So. I suppose one of our earliest message was to actually not be in those areas or not access those areas where we predicted um, the most significant um, fire impacts would be because we absolutely knew that areas would become isolated and roads would be cut. Um, and just to paint the picture, East Gippsland in particular and the northeast of Victoria, just roads are basically through forest, um, through a lot of our um, a lot of our local government areas, so they are going to become impacted. The other challenge we had um, once fires had passed was predicting how long roads would be closed for, and that was a real challenge for us due to the extent of the damage. We had damage across over um, 1,200 kilometres of major arterial roads and over 5,000 kilometres of, of minor roads. Um, we did make some predictions uh, for the community especially, um, the impacted communities, and the challenge we had then is we actually got roads open and then had other major events like storms that impacted on our roads and caused further damage. So it caused a lot of angst for our communities, and that was understandable. Um, people were trying to access the property, um, their homes, or even lost homes, and were trying to get back into areas. So the other challenge that did is as did it, it did in other jurisdictions, is um, servicing crit critical infrastructure and the like. And to the point in Victoria where we basically had to access communities by air or sea to provide um, critical support and relief. So it was very challenging um, to the point in Victoria where we had the, look, the Princess Highway closed for a month. So prediction is, is very, very difficult because the road infrastructure becomes so much more... Um, available for damage, if you like, once the vegetation and the like is, is removed from the sides of the roads. Um, and, and in Victoria, I suppose the other point I would make is from a risk-based approach, um, hazardous trees are one of the most um, um, biggest risks to either um, the community or road users. And when you're through such a heavily forested area, the management of those has hazardous trees before roads is roads are open and critical and unfortunately in Victoria we saw the adverse impact of trees uh, this year on, on community members um, to the point where we, we did have some deaths so um, very challenging um, we do our best but it is very dynamic and thank, Thanks for that Mr Stevenson, we will come back to that that side of it uh, with Mr Tucker I've got one more question and it's not a hypothetical but it, and it drags on your evidence just now and also the trucking associations this morning and I suppose we had a situation where the Esperance Highway is closed or the Air Highway is closed on the way to Norseman, causing a backup of trucks that we know is going to uh, go for uh, a period. Noting that the evidence this morning said that affects trucks all the way up to Cairns uh, on the, the network. What mechanism do you have or forum do you have in place that Mr Snook can get on to Mr Brown Mr Staples, Mr Stevenson and Mr Lunson to say this is what the situation here and you can all look at uh, and provide advice on what alternative routes might be there, noting that up each, of the st each of your states had fires going at the same time so the obvious alternative routes weren't there. What's the forum and mechanism that you have to help the, the trucking uh, associations and companies come up with what is the best route, acknowledging that's going to add extra traffic and uh, and, the, and congestion on on some roads. Is there a forum, or how does that uh, work nationally? I might as well start with Western Australia and we'll work backwards through the through the through the states. It, do, do you have a forum, or it's more you pick up the phone and talk to your compatriots in each of the states? Yeah, it, it, there isn't a, a, a single forum for, for us. It would be um, uh, our uh, we, we'd, we'd phone up uh, people in South Australia, 
so that that's that's what happened in 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 the the fire at uh, around Christmas and New Year, and so our our, our local uh, uh, regional people phoned up their uh, counterparts in South Australia, and had um, uh, variable message signs put up to to indicate what was going on. Okay, and then I'm assuming then, but Mr Brown can help out here. Then South Australia spoke to New South Wales and Victoria to pass the message uh, on? That's correct. Okay. Correct. And then I'm assuming New South Wales then picked up the phone to Queensland and said, listen, we've got an issue that's that started in Western Australia. You need to be aware of this and, and then work the coordination of alternative routes through the bushfire zones to get the trucks down. Yes, yeah, so we've got, uh, so uh, in New South Wales sense, and I, I know all of the people on tra um, traffic or transport management centres uh, and working arrangements between those centres and essentially priority call lines between those to be able to pick up the phone and, and contact and coordinate. So there is a lot of day-to-day -day operations that go on, not just during a bushfire, but any major incident on a road, because as you'd appreciate, we have a number of, of accidents and other things which can cause closures in, closures in around borders. So those processes work quite well. Uh, the, the point you make about sort of the very long haul routes, uh, I think the future lies there around better technology platforms. This is moving very rapidly in terms of data and technology globally. And I would foresee over the next few years, the combination of us being able to have open data, third party providers with platforms, and then also the trucking industry's investment in its own um, telemetrics. Um, in having better information about where their trucks are on the network, where they're at with their fatigue limits, so that they can make operational decisions in a very dynamic environment. Because um, your point about a truck leaving Cairns going to Melbourne, um, I wouldn't be able to predict what's going on in New South Wales for that truck when it leaves Cairns, because it is too far away in terms of time. So it needs to be a very dynamic response. So I think there's some more scope to improve that engagement with the trucking industry, and I think there's some underlying technology that um, we can give that data to third party providers in the trucking industry will get better at their, their sort of own monitoring of their of their trucks over time as well, which will really start to help uh, decision making for all, for everyone. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that, Mr Staples. That was a, a good answer. And I, and I didn't want to put everyone on the spot. I was just out of the, the evidence this morning. It just brought that question to mind on how we do coordinate uh, those national routes. Thank you. Mr Tokley, we'll continue, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, gentlemen, the, the next topic I wanted to speak to you about was what I call strategic roads. Now, the, during a natural disaster, there are roads that are of critical importance for the evacuation of communities, um, for the introduction of firefighting personnel, and occasionally for the maintenance of commerce. And the, the question, the topic concerns who is responsible in emergency management planning for identifying critical or strategic roads that, that are of particular importance or critical importance during a natural disaster? And again, by way of illustration, and not to uh, pick on any one particular state, could I please bring up RMS.001.001.0008? And if I could have the first dot point um, highlighted. Um, and Mr Staples, Mr Dunn, you'll see in, in this paragraph that um, Transport New South Wales actually pre-plans alternate routes for impacted road key corridors. Um, and then it then goes on to say what happened during the last bushfire season. And there are really two, two questions I have around that. The first concerns planning, and the second concerns uh, preparation uh, for those uh, key corridors in terms of mitigating or reducing bushfire risk. So around the planning side, uh, Mr Staples, Transport New South Wales pre-plans or identifies critical roads? Mm -hmm. Yes, what I'd, what I'd say in relation to your sort of categorisation of strategic roads is that we would regard every state road that we look after as being strategic. In a, in a major event. So when you step back and look at the state road network and you think of its function, it's hard to imagine any state road that wouldn't have a strategic importance in a major event. So the way we approach it is quite consistent across all of those. Where that categorisation becomes important is when you drop down into 
the local area management and preparation. So, you know, in New South Wales context, they're the emergency operations centres, which are typically led by a local government lead, such as a general manager in tandem with New South Wales Police, of which we will always have a representative involved in the pre-planning around that. And we would come to the table in those discussions with our state road network as strategic corridors and approaching sort of the local area management. So whether it's in the Blue Mountains area, which is, you know, we're referring to Bell's Line of Road and Great Western Highway in this particular evidence, so we would be working with the Blue Mountains Council and their emergency operations centre coordinating and readiness. And they will be looking at their local roads in tandem with that so that we're joined up. But I would always expect to see in those plans that our state roads are strategic corridors. Right. If, if, if one of those roads is um, the only access to a community, for example, there's only one way in, one way out, is, is, is any preparation undertaken prior to a bushfire to ensure that such a road would be kept, could be kept open in the event of an emergency or the need to evacuate the community? So, look, I'm sure you've had evidence from local government around. What I'd say with the, the state roads is that, generally speaking, they're major thoroughfares. They're not necessarily um, the, the sort of the dead end roads into sort of isolated communities. We are typically sort of major routes. And we would typically have alternate routes to those for our network, as, as opposed to sort of local access roads into small communities. And we saw that on the south coast of New South Wales with places like Lake Conjola with a you know, single road in and out with number of days to sort of get, get out. We don't necessarily have that type of situation. We would typically have an alternate route. What I would say in this fire season, we found the alternate routes being lost at the same time. So in the north of the state, we had the Bruxton and the Guida, Summerland Way and Oxley Highway all being affected. And they were the major links from the coast of New South Wales into the sort of hinterlands to the west. Very unusual to see all of those lost at the same time. Uh, so they're not necessarily emergency evacuation routes, but they are critical supply routes. And we had similar instances in the west and, and to the south as well. So less about individual evacuation, more about sort of strategic links. Thank you. Um, sorry, Chair. So in that case, can I just build on that, that, that question? Because we've had a number of witnesses that have talked about <coughs> the, uh, what's actually, for all intents and purposes, the fitness for purpose of some of the roads to be evacuation routes. And I know Mr Tokely's going to go there, but I may as well build on it now. From the evidence and from many of your submissions, uh, we talk about the predominant reason the roads were closed was due to falling trees. And, uh, and uh, that's one issue from an evacuation point of view, but it's also an issue from responders trying to get to, to fight the fires or the floods or whatever that, that might be. Uh, it hampers the recovery efforts, uh, which we saw in New South Wales and Victoria predominantly uh, around that East Gippsland and the southern New South Wales areas. Uh, and then also we, we've talked about uh, or alluded to the impact on state and national economies uh, there as well. I've had a look at each of your bushfire risk assessment documents and your models and all that, and they all seem to be uh, doing assessment of the impact uh, of uh, or the risk to the roads uh, that a fire may present, not the risk to the road system as a result of the fires. So is there a document we haven't asked for there in your preparation and how you handle this risk assessment, or is it you have focused purely on the risk of the fires, not the risk from the fires? So um, from a New South Wales yep. point of view, and, and Mr Dynan might um, add to this a little bit for me as well, but typically assessments done on a individual road corridor and the measures of mitigations we would put in, knowing that we've got uh, for a state-based road network, alternative routes to also put in place to, to, to uh, divert traffic away from that while we recover. What we found in this particular instance, both for, the, for that east-west movement from the north coast to the sort of hinterlands, as well as from the south coast back into the Sydney and sort of Canberra areas, that the alternate routes were also cut. And so there's a sort of a strategic consideration around that. 
In terms of uh, the corridors itself, and I will hand to John to talk a bit more about this, what we found in um, the Hume Highway and the Pacific Highway, which have had major investments over the last 20 or 30 years, dual carriageways, vegetation setback, we were able to recover those roads very quickly because the vegetation was further set back. So that, you know, is a real insight for us around sort of the corridor resilience uh, and being able to recover. It's not a case that you won't be able to, won't be able to avoid closing the road, it's just how quickly you can return them to, to provide access. Contrast that with the Princess Highway, which is a much narrower carriageway with a much more forested area around it. And we certainly took, in some instances, days to recover that road. And so for us going forward, we will look at, you know, as we go through an upgrade of that road, which is on, which has got an investment mm -hmm. sort of commitment to it at the moment, we'll look to replicate the sorts of conditions that we see on the roads like the Hume Highway uh, and the Pacific Highway so that we've got faster and more rapid recovery uh, in those sort of key routes. So Mr Dynan can probably talk a little bit more about some of that sort of vegetation management side if you'd like. Yeah, and before Mr Dynan does that, I'd just be interested, is there a program to look at the risks, <coughs> sorry, the lessons that, that came out of the last few months particular around the fires, and I understand we've driven the Princess Highway as a part of the Commission's work. We understand the difficulties you've got, but acknowledging that the road upgrades will take decades, uh, is there a, a program that that is being thought of now to try and reduce the risk to as low as reasonably practical with what you've got, or uh, do we just let it sit? Mr Dynan. No, okay. um. Sorry, I'm mute, Mr. Jordan. Uh, yeah, we do have a, and we have a, um, to answer your question directly, yes, we have res reviewed the response to, the, to those routes um, since the bushfires, and we've got a three point plan that we're looking at, and one of them d is about building resilience uh, on each of the key networks, picking up a couple of particular network, uh, strategic routes that we have. We fill the Princess Highway in the, in the south and the Guaida Highway in the north were particular routes, both key freight routes and both key routes across to allow some uh, level of redundancy across main north-south routes uh, that we're looking to um, look at what vegetation may be within the road reserve that we could thin out to ensure that the, while the fire is going through, obviously the road will be closed. I post the fire front moving through that we'll be able to recover the road very quickly and not have a residual risk of both safety to both responders and to uh, the travelling public. Picking up Mr Staple's point earlier that yeah, our alternative plans are around um, a previous experience around uh, both incidents and emergencies in the past and it's it certainly, in my experience, is quite unprecedented to have a number of roads in a particular region all closed and so effectively isolating an area. Um, East-west routes from particularly where of in the north where I did some experience in the past, we were usually able to rely on the alternate, the next route down, so the Bruxton went out, the Guida was uh, active and vice versa. Um, in this case, we had all four of those routes out and similarly in the south between the Kings and Snow Mountains Highway, quite different in geography um, apart and quite unusual for them to go out at the same time and notwithstanding that if we we're able to get them through traffic from the coast up into the highlands we also had trouble around uh, the Monaro Highway and the Hume Highway so quite widespread but we were able to recover the important routes as in the Pacific Highway, Hume Highway relatively quickly and we're looking to have a, a wider corridor of um, clearer vegetation to allow that to be recovered very quickly. Oh, thank you for that. And I understand this was unprecedented. I guess it's not anymore, but uh, as, we, as we look forward. Um, Victoria, similar similar question to you. Noting your risk plans, it's the risk of fire, not the risk from fire. What, uh, what do you see there for the way forward from your point of view? Yes, so from a Victorian point of view, we, we do have... Uh, some agencies, and I know certainly from a public land perspective, they do look at the resilience of their roads post bushfire for access and egress, and that's for firefighters uh, and community access if alternative access is required. Um, so there is some work done there, and I know some work's been done around um, the Princess Highway in the past. I think one of the complicating factors for us is um, 
there is not total agreement here, even with communities around um, to what level of resilience and clearing we should we should uh, achieve. And I say that in respect to people living in some of those areas purely around it is in the it is in the bush, if you like, and and they really. Um, hold dear those values. It's the balance, achieving that balance between what's an appropriate amount of clearing on road reserves versus, um, you know, what's environmentally um, sensitive and, and responsible. Um, so there are some roads, and especially the great example um, for us this year would be roads like the access to Mallacoota and the Princess Highway between Can River and Mallacoota, where to achieve total resilience of that network, it would be substantial clearing of roads required. And um, so for me, it's it's a multifaceted sort of approach. It's what can you do to um, uh, hopefully get back on those roads as soon as possible, but still maintain the integrity of the environment um, for those communities. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, the other thing we, as I mentioned earlier, is we do understand that those communities will be impacted and roads will be cut off um, access to those communities. So the, the, the leave early um, bit for us is critical as well. So it's a whole package, um, but I do I do understand that I think there is the opportunity to look at what some base resilience standards look like. Thank you for that. And I, and I understand it. It's a it's a complex issue. It's not a simple issue to uh, to to address. But mm -hmm. thanks for that. I'll hand back to Mr. Tokley, and we'll continue, and then we'll do some questions at the end. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, gen gentlemen, just while I've got you, um, we uh, and this is for New South Wales and uh, Victoria. We heard um, last week from various local governments, in particular the Snowy Valleys, Snowy Monaro, and Taewong local government areas and about the uh, bushfires that crossed from one state into the other state and then back in again. Um, and we heard from them about the use of the roads and access to the roads in those areas. Now, um, one of the things that we heard was that um, Taewong had identified a evacuation centre uh, in New South Wales. Obviously, it was necessary for people from Taewong to go to New South Wales, and it might have been necessary to go the other way. I'm particularly interested to know whether there is any um, identification of cross-border roads that are or may be critical for the purposes of evacuating from one state into another state um, in any planning that's undertaken, uh, both in New South Wales and in uh, Victoria. Mr. Staples? Yes, so the way that that's managed, it, I'd probably just give a generic sort of uh, response rather than talking to the specifics of that location. Mm -hmm. And I, I know Victoria have similar arrangements, although they use slightly different terminology. We have, uh, I think I referred to them before, emergency operations centres that are largely based on local government area, led by general managers with police, and we have representatives in there. Along the borders, those uh, EOCs, as we refer to them, actually do pre-planning uh, in conjunction with their equivalent on the other side. Um, so there's certainly an intent there that there's a coordination around the road networks. Now, I, I gave evidence before that for the state roads, uh, we treat those as strategic. So you can imagine for the significant state roads that those are strategic and they cross the border. Yes. Mm -hmm. There would be a number of other sort of local roads that also cross the border that the, the EOC sort of planning would need to capture about how important they are from an evacuation point of view. But I would say that, you know, a, a big reflection for me out of uh, the, the events is the on-the-ground knowledge from the local people preparing these plans is very critical. These terrains are really difficult, so the, the, it would be very easy for me to say that it can be done from, from where I sit at a senior level, but I really think making sure that the, uh, the local area coordination and those, those local committees and the structures, which I think are very good, um, the, the coordination uh, is, the, is the key sort of piece across those borders and those, those groups working really well together and using those forums to maximise the, the evacuation routes. Thank you, Mr. Staples. And Mr. Stephenson, Mr. Northey? Yes, yeah, so from a Victorian perspective, I just built on New South Wales. Um, one of the things that we do do is uh, where we have cross-border 
um, uh, close cross-border relationships with other agencies. We, we do put together cross-border plans and response arrangements um, that can be enacted, especially when fires are, are quite close to the border. So that's, that's done. Um, one of the other things that we do is quite often put liaison officers in other jurisdictions and, and that's extremely important, as New South Wales pointed to. Because of the dynamic nature of, of emergencies, that gives us a contact from our own state in an incident management team in another state to, to transfer information. And then if we have things like um, differences of language um, or acronym, acronyms, um, then those things can be worked through to try to minimise disruption. But it is dynamic and, and even the identification identification of strategic roads across jurisdictions. Um, we only have to have a look this year at the, the fire behaviour and, and some of our most major um, types of in infrastructure were, were overrun by fire. So it's dynamic and I think the best way to deal with it is that really close link at the incident management level. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. Um, uh, moving, moving on. Um, Mr. Lunson from Queensland, uh, you would have heard the earlier discussion that the question is around the identification of strategic or critical roads for the purposes of uh, evacuation um, or the bringing in of firefighting agencies. In, in Queensland, are, there, are steps taken to identify such roads? Yes, certainly we have um, key diversion routes for different parts of the network. Um, and as you'd imagine, a stretch of road may have one or two sections within it that are, have a, a higher risk rating than other parts, and they're the areas we typically concentrate on. Um, however, every natural disaster has its own uh, set of complications and circumstances. So. What might be a good diversion route for one type of incident would not be good for another. Um, and so we like to take a more holistic approach and keep our op options open. Uh, and again, similar to what was mentioned in some of the earlier evidence, um, we do rely heavily on the local knowledge um, that is available of, of what parts of the network will be affected based on what type of natural disaster occurs. And that can typically um, be available to individuals from history, uh, what's happened there in the past, certainly from a flooding point of view. Fires, probably to a lesser degree, but that's still important information. Um, in addition to that, from a planning perspective, uh, we have a, a roadside bushfire risk assessment model, which was introduced a number of years ago. Um, that identifies the risk rating along the road corridor and then we have uh, funds set aside to treat those risks um, based on the priority level that that uh, risk then calculates out. So that's a, a planning and prevention measure that's been put in place fairly recently. Um, and, and together with the normal planning process that each local gov government area in, in consultation with the department departments uh, undertakes uh, gives you that holistic approach. Thank you. Um, in relation to cross-border routes between Queensland and New South Wales, um, is there, are there, at the planning stage, is there identification of any critical roads in order to enable people from New South Wales going to Queensland or vice versa? Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, again, that would be more at the local government to local government level, um, but certainly we have involvement probably more from a QFES, QPS point of view rather than from a department of, of main roads point of view, um, particularly in those sorts of emergency situations. And then there's some consultation between the different management groups as to how best to manage that situation uh, and the risk of road closures occurring, you know, forcing the public one way or the other. Thank you, Mr Lanson. Uh, Mr Brown, the position in South Australia regarding the identification of critical roads? Mm. Um, 
Similar to the other jurisdictions, uh, we undertake a, an assessment of the road network under our care control uh, to ensure that there are sort of detour routes or um, other um, routes available for um, uh, egress from um, a particular emergency um, position. The, the, the main difference being in South Australia is that we don't specifically plan for a particular type of disaster. Um, it is more of a generic um, uh, event and um, we have emergency uh, management arrangements around those um, uh, generic events. Um, typically, uh, South Australia is uh, generally, because of the, the extent of our borders, we have multiple entry and exit points um, across the network, probably the only one exception being the air highway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Brown. And Mr Snook, in terms of um, Western Australia, I mean, obviously the uh, air highway is a critical road, being the main road between South Australia and Western Australia. In fact, I think it's the only sealed road between the two states, is it not? Mm. Uh, no, there's, there's another one, the Victoria yeah. Highway, uh, between uh, Western Australia and Northern Territory. Mm. So we have two. Right. Um, so as from a Western Australian point of view, uh, the strategic um, uh, roads are the, the, the roads that, are, that form the state road network. So, uh, and, and we treat those um, in an incident that uh, uh, we're where an incident occurs uh, on, on one of those uh, routes, we, we try to look um, uh, if there's an alternative route and uh, uh, within, within Western Australia there are alternative routes but uh, when it comes to uh, interstate uh, uh, movements uh, there's usually not an alternative route and in those cases the, um, the, the, the road closure uh, has, to, has to stay in place until the um, until the incident is cleared. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, you've all spoken about the... Um, we've all acknowledged that there are roads that pass between the various states, both at the state level, that is, the major roads, but also at the local government level in, in terms of local government roads. Are there any formal agreements in existence concerning the um, movement uh, between the states on local government roads, to your knowledge? Mr Stables? Um, not that I'm aware of. I could ask Mr Dynan whether he's aware of any particular instances on that. Uh, they'd be just managed under the local emergency management plans, mm. uh, but not at a local level as uh, they cross the border. Thank you. Mr Stevenson, Mr Northey? Mm. Yes, yeah, same to Victoria. Okay. And Mr. Local level. Local level. Mr. Lunson? Yeah, I'd agree with uh, the other states on that. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, I want to, uh, Commissioners, I want to now turn to a third topic. Um, so I'll be leaving that topic. Um, gentlemen, the, the third topic I wish you to address concerns the reopening of roads after a major natural disaster, whether it be a bushfire or flood. And again, to help the discussion, I wish to bring up a document. It's um, EMV at double, 0007 dot 0001 dot 0183. And I could have the first paragraph, which is number 970, highlighted. Uh, uh, General, we heard a, we've heard a lot about um, the, the op reopening of roads and sometimes how long it's taken to reopen roads. And um, Victoria has identified a particular issue here regarding the interpretation of requirements around the reopening of roads. And I, I will ask if, if it's all right, Mr Stevenson, Mr Northey, to speak to this paragraph and then I'll turn to each of you in turn. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think this one specifically um, relates to um, interpretation of some of the uh, operating procedures that we have. And it is subjective um, and it 
specifically goes to the management of uh, dangerous or hazardous trees. So in Victoria, we have a, a, a standard for uh, determining what a hazardous tree is, but that is uh, really relying on someone's interpretation uh, of whether the tree is hazardous or not. And even between qualified arborists, that, that can be different, that interpretation. So there's some difficulty there. Um, in relation to the other document, that's the document in relation to what road closure look like. So in Victoria, we have, uh, I think it's four categories, A to D, in relation to roads only are being closed to everyone except emergency response. And then that gradually opens up based on, you know, might be access to critical infrastructure and then to local residents and, and then to right through to full um, opening of a road. So it's basically just interpretation of that document and that can become a little bit complex when you work across jurisdictional boundaries if you're not necessarily talking the same language. And I think there was an instance um, in relation to traffic moving from the likes of Mallacoota um, north up towards Eden in New South Wales this year where we might say a road's um, open to a certain level in Victoria and that might necessarily match what the categorisation is in New South Wales. So I think that's predominantly what that um, paragraph is alluding to. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. I might just bring up the point, the next paragraph, which is 971, which I think is the, the point Mr Stevenson was just addressing. And if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to read that, Mr Stevenson. Hmm. So I think that's um, pretty much what I covered in the last um, uh, my last response. So what happens is just if I could use an example, like for a community member, someone who is a resident in a town that has had a road closed, um, there's opportunities to have different levels of access for those residents. So if someone's got a pecuniary interest and the road is now safe enough, and I must emphasise this is only once the road is safe, um, allowing people through when it's not safe is, is not a smart thing to do. So once the road is declared to be safe enough to maybe escort a resident through, um, then that can be allowed. What that often creates, though, is other people with maybe not the same level of interest in that community may wonder why they are, are unable to access um, the same road or why someone from outside of that community can't access that road. And, and most often, um, the context that's around, we still are managing risks on the road or road works, um, or there might be um, a chance that the road will be closed again. So I think there is sometimes a little bit of confusion with the community about that, um, but it is quite dynamic and quite difficult to deal with. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. Um, Mr Staples? Certainly. The, like, like Victoria, we have a risk-based approach. Um, so the closure of the road is not a decision for us. It's made by RFS and police. And at some point after a fire event, at a point where RFS feel that it's safe for others to return to the road, it's handed back to us and also to utility companies such as energy companies because often uh, running parallel with road corridors are power lines and they represent a particular risk as well. So it's not just within the domains of our own people making assessment. We need to do that in partnership with sort of other key asset holders within that corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would reflect on from uh, this season is the importance of that risk-based approach and being very alert to the particular circumstance that, you're, yeah, that you are in. So we want to reopen a road when we're really comfortable that it's completely safe. Uh, and that will be things like guardrails, it'll be tree fall, safety signage and those sorts of things. So everything else being equal, we would take the time to go and do all of the repair work and reopen the road in its full state. Uh, and that would be one sort of approach at full speed. Bring some other criteria to the table in terms of the risk-based approach and what you might decide is that, in fact, there's no alternate route for a community to be able to escape. Uh, there are other factors around needing to get them out. So what we would do is adjust our risk mindset around this, um, clear the road, do a, a rapid risk assessment of major tree fall, take the high-priority trees out, 
then set up potentially some sort of escort arrangement with police to be able to escort people out. There is a level of risk there, but that's traded off against the, the, the risk of leaving people in a particular community. Um, that has to be really thought about quite deeply at a local level in terms of balancing the risk, and we certainly found ourselves in that circumstance on a number of occasions. Um, Mr Dinan can probably talk to that a little bit more, if you'd like, in terms of some of the things that we dealt with both drawn on the north coast as well as down the south coast. Yes, yes. yes. Mr Dinan. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Rod. Yeah, the, just going through, it was really a basis on on the risk and the local community's needs. Um, some communities, similar to Victoria, we would have roads closed to outsiders but allow resident access, and usually that resident access was via um, uh, a pilot or, or just a, a convoy in and out. Um, in trying to reopen roads, we also took into account the, the were other... Uh, surrounding uh, environment. So the four east-west routes in the north, we were got very close to Christmas and not all of them were open and we made a risk assessment on the Oxley Highway, for example. The big risk there was, if you know the Oxley Highway is quite uh, hangers off the side of the escarpment, uh, significant safety barrier uh, damage and we just set up an escort up and down the uh, the escarpment so that we were allowed to get people to do access to get access, but it wasn't a free access and it wasn't a two way access, so to manage that risk again at a lower speed, as Mr. Staple points out. Um, and certainly there are other occasions we've already alluded to when we did set up convoys for for key for key um, uh, supplies and things to go in. So it is very much a risk based. We usually do it through the emergency operations centre, who may be able to getting uh, particular um, issues being ar arising that may need to be addressed by access to uh, either through the work or to areas within within the area damaged by fires. So it is a bit of a risk assessment approach are multifaceted from that point of view. Thank you. In, in terms of um, roads that go between the two states, New South Wales and Victoria, is there an, an arrangement between the two states regarding the reopening of roads so that you are aware when it will be reopened in Victoria and vice versa? So certainly that is coordinated generally between our traffic management or transport management centre and the equivalent in, in any other state where we've got uh, a, an incident or a traffic accident. In the course of a major emergency, that would also be coordinated at a state emergency operations centre. Uh, one of the other witnesses from another state talked about having liaison officers. So we've actually got a couple of different channels where that coordination can be done, but we've got good working arrangements where if we know a road is closed but it will imminently open, uh, on the Victorian side, we will get advance notice from our equivalent transport management centre in Victoria that that would happen in terms of some timing. What that allows us to do is our road crews on the ground to be able to be on, on point to be able to remove the sort of diversion information and detour information that might be on the roads in advance and then to also update obviously our public information. We'd also target resources to some of those routes if we thought though we're going to be open by the uh, adjoining jurisdiction so that we had some coordination. But other times we used our resources on some of those key routes because they were in the area um, and probably the Princess Highway was the classic there. We had people in that area and, and opened that, but as been the Victorians pointed out, it was a very difficult route for them to reopen uh, quickly. So our, our side was, uh, we just kept the road closed so we didn't let people to go into that high risk area on the Victorian side of the border. And in, in the recovery phase, the coordination did go as far as uh, we had some additional resources available in New South Wales to actually go and support Victoria in some of the recovery in the northern sections of the Princess Highway, just to really help the broader community in terms of getting those roads open as quick as we could. Thank you, Mr Staples. Could I please bring up um, document number EMV.0007.0001.0080 and if I could have paragraph 354.4 and um, if I could go back again to uh, Victoria please, Mr Christ Stevenson and Mr Norvey. Um, you'll see in the second sentence, 
you mentioned that there were sometimes differences in road categorization between states, resulting in different decisions being made on either side of state borders about the closure or reopening of roads. If, if you could comment upon that sentence, please. Yes, I think, um, sorry, I just lost that. Um, as, as we've spoken about, um, I think this goes to the road closure um, categorisation. So we might still have a road closed in Victoria but have certain levels of access, whereas if our terminology and that's not quite the same across jurisdictions, um, then that might be perceived to be a road closed and no one can get through on the Victorian border. So it goes to the heart of having, um, as we spoke about, uh, especially in those incident management teams, and it's not probably only at the incident level, it goes to um, regional um, and the state level, having those liaison officers there to be really clear that when those conversations are happening across jurisdictional um, lines on the map, if you like, um, we understand what the level of closure is. I think that's that's um, what we were speaking about there. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. And, and Mr Lunton in Queensland, if you could comment upon the uh, reopening of roads between Queensland and New South Wales. <coughs> Sure. Uh, between Queensland and New South Wales, we have a, a very good relationship that's been built up over, over several years. Um, during the bushfires, uh, we had a number of roads uh, that were heavily impacted. And prior to Mount Lindsay Highway being probably one of the main ones I'm thinking of, prior to that road being opened, um, on our side anyway, we did talk or consult with the TMC across the border. Uh, in some cases, uh, whilst our section of the, uh, the network was open, we did keep it closed slightly longer because the corresponding section of the network in New South Wales was still impacted by fire. Um, and I think that, that worked in a, in a similar way from the New South Wales border up. Um, so certainly from my point of view and everything I've seen, the, the relationship there is quite good and uh, fluid, as Mr Staples said earlier. Is it, a, is it a formal arrangement, Mr Lunson? Well, it's a formal uh, information sharing range between the TMCs. Um, if, if you're meaning from a formal point of view, is there a MOA or MOU in place? I, I couldn't give you that answer at the moment. But I, I, I do know from talking to a number of the officers working in the TMC that there is a good level of communication across the border. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Lanson. Uh, Mr. Brown, for, were there any um, uh, yes, were there any differences that South Australia encountered in terms of its borders with either New sorry Victoria or Western Australia over road openings? Hmm. Uh, I'm not aware of any differences that created issues in terms of um, openings or closures. Um, I perhaps re-echo um, what some of the other jurisdictions have stated in regards to the um, relationships between um, traffic management centres and the, the good information sharing that occurs between um, each of the centres. Um, that, um, for our purposes, is built into our operating procedures in terms of um, sharing that information, but um, um, I, I am not aware of any other issues. Thank you, Mr Brown. Mr Snook? Mm. Uh, as far as um, across border um, issues, really we we don't have any um, uh, in, any issues there. Um, if an incident is uh, there's usually a, a, no incident is big enough to sort of cover the uh, a length from uh, the, across the borders. Uh, as far as uh, incidents that occur within Western Australia, uh, we work closely with uh, with DFES and. Uh, if there's ever any, uh, 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 where, where there's a fire and there's trees that, that are burned out, we do joint inspections with um, with DFES and we, we get uh, agreement with, with them straight away on uh, any dangerous trees that need removing. removing. And then uh, th that occurs and then uh, then the road gets, gets open safely. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Snook. Um, Commissioners, I'm thinking of moving on to another topic. I was wondering whether you have any questions arising out of that topic. No, we'll, we'll have a few questions at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen, the last topic I want to move on to is um, 
what you might call roadside cl clearing or vegetation management and costs associated with those matters. And can I start with Queensland, please, and bring up document TMQ 0002.001.0028. And, and Mr. Lunson, could, could you uh, give us an overview of the 2019 roadside bush risk assessment model that's been adopted by Queensland? Hmm. Sure. Um, that was a, a model which was piloted in 2017-2018 uh, uh, in a number of districts, districts across the state. Uh, it's now, uh, from 2019, it was rolled out statewide. Uh, what it does, it, um, it creates a model across the state of, of bushfire risk according to the level of vegetation. Um, our uh, road network is then overlaid uh, across that map or raster uh, that's created and then the risk bushfire risk profile is calculated from that um, and that takes into account um, the consequence of any fire on human health, uh, property, the economy, the environment um, and uh, any, any local actions and uh, cross-referenced against the likelihood uh, of, of what would occur. So that, um, that tool is applied um, and then treatment methodologies are developed from that. So you can imagine that uh, the fairly diverse state that Queensland is, the treatment methodology in one area might be different to another. So we might be doing um, vegetation clearance, for example, in one area. In another area, it might be controlled burns, uh, again, depending on the type of vegetation and the terrain. Um, and, and that's managed from a central uh, location and then the different areas of the state are allocated funds according to the risk profile. Mm -hmm. And is that, um, you mentioned that the different areas of the state are allocated funds according to the risk profile. Is that funded by the Queensland government or by local authorities or how is that funded? Mm. Uh, it's funded by the Queensland government. Thank you very so much. Throughout, throughout. Sorry. Sorry. I, I beg your pardon, I interrupted oh, just you. Throughout. Oh, it's through our maintenance and preservation um, allocation, essentially. Thank you, Mr. Lunson. Um, could I please have a document RCN.900.029.0001? And Mr. Stevenson and Mr. Norther, you'll see this is the Victorian Road bush Bushfire Risk Assessment Guideline and Risk Mapping Methodology. And Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Northy, if you could just give an outline of this document and the um, what's involved. Yeah, so it's a similar approach to um, what we've just heard in Queensland. So all of our roadsides uh, on our real road network have been mapped uh, in terms of uh, fire risk. I should say the focus of the document is really on the uh, potential ignition or spreading of fire within the road reserves um, rather than more broadly beyond uh, road reserve. We would then look at um, our, our classification system for our arterial road network uh, as part of a, a risk matrix approach and uh, basically as to, um, assign a risk um, to each of uh, areas of the road reserve. Uh, then at a regional level, uh, we would work with our um, uh, counterparts in the municipal fire management plan committees to agree on that risk. Uh, from there, we would develop our work plans in terms of uh, any fire management activities that we would carry out in the road reserves and uh, work with um, local um, CFA, et cetera, in terms of uh, making sure that those plans uh, meet the purpose, basically. So largely the activities we carry out as, uh, as a result of this uh, really involves grass cutting and some uh, trimming of uh, tree branches, et cetera. In terms of some of the areas that uh, uh, were affected by the 2019-20 bushfires, uh, I think we've already heard that, you know, in the case of East Gippsland, I think about 80% uh, 
of the uh, road reserve and surrounding area outside the road reserve is actually uh, state state forest, so it's heavily wooded. So in those areas, um, you know, the amount of work that we would do uh, would be uh, uh, not as great. So it certainly doesn't involve um, removing um, trees, and in a lot of cases, the trees are outside the uh, the road reserve. And there's also areas too where we just can't, um, in some cases, access uh, beyond the road reserve due to the terrain, etc. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. And it, are the costs for the, the activities that are undertaken funded by the state? Mm. Yes, they are. So we uh, get an allocation every year from uh, the state uh, across Victoria. Um, and uh, this work is carried out as part of uh, what we call our routine maintenance of, of our uh, arterial road network. Mm -hmm. I can just add um, to Mr Norley's point in relation to, especially um, in Gippsland, there has been some collaboration between um, road authorities and the public land managers also in relation to fuel management, where the Princess Highways had work undertaken on a, like some larger scale um, fuel reduction burning and some clearing um, between agencies, so sort of a multi-agency approach on that network as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could now go to New South Wales, Mr Staples, Mr Dynan, does New South Wales have an equivalent uh, program to either Queensland or uh, Victoria in terms of the road bushfire risk assessments? We do uh, take a slightly different approach. I'll hand to Mr Dynan, who's got more of the hands-on uh, knowledge in this space. That we, we, we have that corridor assessment more in an integrated fashion in terms of taking account of all the other risks in a corridor rather than calling out bushfire as an independent process or an independent uh, sort of funding stream because uh, we see the vegetation uh, clearing or management not just being about fire but being about other road usage risks in terms of sight lines and road runoff and so forth. So Mr Dyne can probably talk a bit more about the methodology we go through there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr Staples. Um, yeah, the bushfire uh, risk assessment is usually managed through the local emergency management plans and the district emergency management plans, which we support, and the uh, we support the RFS in their risk assessment of both areas for, for fires and support them there. That support might be from time to time RFS carrying out uh, back burning as per their requirements, which will support around the state road network with traffic control, um, probably um, occupancy licences, things like that, to allow that uh, risk management to occur. Um, additionally to that, we'll also do some assessment of vegetation within the road corridor, um, similar to other jurisdictions that we do grass cutting, um, cut down hazardous branches, and perhaps removal of some uh, high risk uh, vegetation as the high-risk vegetation may not only be a fire risk, but can also be a road safety risk. So by having a clear zone around the road, you get a, a number of advantages. So it's primarily around the bushfire, though, we support the local emergency management plans and the district plans and carry out activities within our routine maintenance budgets that support that. Right, thank you. Thank you, Mr Dunn. If I could please have up um, document RMS.001.001.0006. If I could have the, under the heading vegetation management, highlighted. Mm. And Mr Dunn, if you wouldn't mind taking just a moment to read those three paragraphs. Tell me when you're ready, Mr. Dynan. Mm. Yes, yes, I'm ready. Yes, thank you. Yep. I wasn't sure whether um, these three bullet points are suggested improvements uh, or they are um, comments upon the present system that is in existence in New South Wales. Mm. They they were suggested improvements. That said, there are elements that are already embedded within our maintenance activities to assess risk for bushfires, but obviously the incident emergency that occurred 
during 19 and 20 has highlighted um, the increased risk, I suppose, from uh, bushfire, particularly the widespread nature of it. And our reflection on that risk has been to look at something more comprehensive um, to be able to make sure that key routes allow a, a higher level of resilience as we've touched on earlier. Yes, th thank you very much. And could I please bring up um, RMS.001.001.0005? And under the heading, if you could enlarge the last two dot points under the heading Corridor Resilience. And Mr. Dynan, um, th this is under the heading, as, as you can see, Corridor Resilience. And it, in the first paragraph, it's talking about the estimated um, damage to the infrastructure as a result of the last bushfires. And then uh, you, the next dot point talks about where corridors have been built or upgraded to a higher standard of resilience. Key sections of road were able to be cleared and opened faster to enable evacuation and transportation of critical yes. supplies. And I think Mr Staples mentioned these matters earlier and he gave an example of the Pacific Highway as well. If I could just have, please, RMS... Dot double zero one dot double zero one dot triple zero six and the uh, top paragraph at the page with the four paragraphs underneath that could, that could be highlighted. I think that was one of the examples that Mr. Staples gave earlier today. That's correct. And, and my, my question really concerns the, the cost of matters, uh, given that the estimate of damage for the last bushfires was approximately or estimated $77 million worth of damage. Is, is the cost of damage taken into account in um, determining how much money might be spent in building resilience into the road network? Uh, it certainly has is one of the inputs. Mm -hmm. um, it comes out of our, generally out of our asset management plan uh, and that is obviously based on both the size and value of the asset under management. Um, the area, the Pacific Highway, the $77 million was right across the state, so from the northern border with Queensland right down to Victoria, which is quite, quite an extensive area. Yeah. And where the input that we have into that, across that area, we generally spend something of the order of uh, four to five hundred but three to four hundred million dollars on routine maintenance across the the state, um, and that certainly is an input to try ensure that not only we manage that asset manage management budget as well as we can, so that we don't have to be replacing uh, assets, but also I think uh, what we're touching on here is the significant community benefit from having the resilience of the network. So while the cost is one input. Certainly the community disruption and cost is probably a much larger one and one that we're focusing on when we look at the resilience of these networks and the need to invest in them. Thank you very much, Mr Dynan. Um, I think, I'm not sure, Mr Brown, Mr Snook, whether I asked you the question around whether South Australia has any equivalent programs to that implemented in Queensland and New South Wales regarding roads. Um, in South Australia, we have a similar arrangement to that that New South Wales described. Um, we don't have a specific bushfire um, vegetation management um, approach um, as um, Queensland and Victoria illustrated, um, but we look at it from a road safety perspective more broadly and holistically. Uh, and we undertake our uh, maintenance requirements um, in accordance with our asset management plans um, and maintenance plans and um, the roles and responsibilities that we have in terms of in, in, in ensuring a, a safe corridor. Thank you very much, Mr Brown. Mr Snook? Mm. Uh, in Western Australia, we, we do not have um, uh, uh, documents uh, similar to Queensland and Victoria. Um, we, we base uh, all of the uh, the, the work uh, on, on our sort of general asset management uh, standards, and, and also sort of linking that back to the uh, the, the safety standards uh, for the road. Thank you very much, Mr. Snook. Um, uh, 
Chair, that concludes my questions on, on all topics. There may be some questions. Um, there's, there's a couple of questions from, uh, from here, additional questions. Commissioner McIntosh. Mm. Thanks, Chair. Um, we've just been chatting a lot about dealing with the risk of tree fall on roads impeding recoveries. Uh, recovery and and it, it seems to me that there's two potential strategies you could use to deal with this risk. One is you remove trees from the tree from the road corridor, as we've been discussing, and some of those benefits are in this document that's on on the screen at the moment. And the other approach is increasing your capacity to to rapidly remove trees when they fall. It, it would appear from what you've said and in and in the documents that. Um, capacity constraints were an issue. And I just wondered, I'll address the question to Mr Staples, the extent to which uh, transport for New South Wales is, is looking at increasing its capacity to, to remove trees and to clear trees once they fall or if they fall? I'd say, I agree with your assertion about the strategy. I think both of those strategies actually work together. Uh, I wouldn't single one out over the other. And certainly from a supply chain point of view, we lent very heavily on our supply chain to respond. And actually, I don't think there was too often where we felt that we were short of resources on the ground to get in and recover. It's just at very large lengths. And the time required to do it safely, because bear in mind, uh, often where fatalities occur in bushfire events is around tree falls with firefighters and so forth. So there's some really important safety protocols for our arborists when they're out to, to clear trees and do um, safety assessments and so forth, which just take some time. Mr Dynams uh, was actually very involved in the, the procurement of the supply chain, so he can talk more specifically about sort of where some of where the things worked really well and where some of the limitations may have been. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr Staples. Um, I, I concur with our supply chain was um, responded very well. We, we do vegetation clearing with um, professional arborists uh, at all times across the state, either responding to storms or just doing routine work around trees. And so we have a quite an extensive list of um, potentials across the state. Um, at this particular situation, even at the peak of our response going to your question, we were able to move, I think it was 15 different crews from across the state into the south coast area. And I don't think physically we could have got any more crews into that area that we had. We, and that break up was, I think, roughly about 10 or 11 of our supply chains. And we had five crews of our, of our own in that area. So we do have ability to respond. Uh, we do have, obviously, our workforce um, had, does have members who are um, bush, you know, farmers and bush type people so used to using chainsaws, skilled at doing that. That is one avenue we use, as well as the professional arborists who come in and assist and, and assess trees. So I, I just felt our, our response there was, was relatively good and probably picking up on, on Mr uh, Staples' point is, you know, there's... Um, uh, we didn't feel like it, it let us down. Probably when, when we look at the north of the state, though, we, we probably... the the gravity of the situation when all four um, highways were shut at once, we probably took a little bit of time to respond and we didn't get resources in from other parts of the state. Once we were able to do that, we got crews, our own crews from Narrabri and Dubbo to come across. We also got a large number of arborists um, <coughs> to come into uh, the northern part of the state just prior to Christmas, probably for most of December, late November through to the to December and work in those areas and once we got those resources there our response was a lot uh, a lot more focused <laughs> a lot more um, a lot quicker to reopen so that was a, probably a learning we got across the uh, across the bushfire season and when we got to southern we knew we just had to hit it hard with all our resources and to be fair to our supply chains those guys responded really quickly um, I think there's an anecdotal story that we put, took guys off the Bells line of road and they didn't even go home it was just around New Year they just drove straight from the Bells line of road where they were cutting down trees straight down the Hume Highway and into the south coast just straight into motels so you know that was the type of level of response we got from our supply chain which I think reflects its professionalism and uh, appropriateness. Thanks very much. Um, Mr Stevenson, is there anything that Victoria wants to add to that? Is that a similar, similar tale in Victoria? Yes, um, what I would add um, is I suppose uh, prior to a fire or a, a, a natural disaster impacting a road, there is merit in removing uh, those hazards that are known. So trees, 
that we know that are already hazardous. The, the complicating factor is obviously post uh, an event, a number of other trees will become hazardous. In Victoria, um, one of the other major considerations is the removal of, of hazardous trees is quite dangerous in its own right. Um, so I think Victoria responded very, very well. Um, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning has a panel of providers um, and within those, that panel, there are specific um, resources to remove trees and that um, includes mechanical harvesters um, from the timber industry um, and those were deployed quite rapidly and worked extensively for, for a long period of time. So um, I, I don't think there's one solution for this, but I think being able to respond quickly is critical. Thanks very much. Thank you. Commissioner Bennett? No, no questions. Chairman, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I think you've given us a good insight into the complexity of the, the road network and managing it and, uh, and identifying managing all the risks that are associated with it. And we appreciate you taking the, the just over two hours to, to spend that time with us. So thank you very much. Uh, Chair, the witnesses could be released from their summons. The witnesses may be released from their summons. Thank you. Um, and Chair, Commissioners, that concludes this afternoon's panel and there's nothing further for today, so mm -hmm. if we could adjourn until 10am tomorrow morning. 10am uh, tomorrow morning, Canberra time. Oh, uh, uh, before we do that, I don't think there was... Sorry, did we get any... I was just wondering if there, we should pause for one moment. We should. No, we'll take it as read. 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, Canberra time. Let's adjourn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay.